minutes. Right. Kimberly, sorry. Kimberly, can you switch the screens on? Yeah. All right. Uh, no, apologies for absence and substitutes, Kimberly. Thank you, Chairman. We have absence um, from Councillor Dan, Dan Hunt and Peter Isherwood, and um, Councillor Dixon's um, not feeling very well, so she has also apologised. <coughs> Um, we have Councillor Stephen Mulliner and Peter Nicholson here as substitutes. Thank you very much. The minutes of the last meeting, <laughs> all 17 minutes of it. Um, I, the, now we're on the Council's website, are they agreed? Uh, thank you very much. Um, declarations of interest. None submitted prior to the meeting, but I believe Councillor Coburn has a declaration. Councillor Coburn. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I must declare an interest in the TPO 13 stroke 21, uh, and I will be leaving the room. I would just like to explain why, because it is slightly convoluted. Uh, I am not a golfer, and I'm not a member of Hankley Common Golf Club, but my husband is. And those of people who don't know us might think that might influence my opinion. But um, uh, anyway, for in the interests of transparency, I will be leaving the room. But actually, I've got a much deeper reason for leaving the room for this item. Shall I carry on? Yeah, but you're the note taker. You sure? Right, so number one, uh, my husband is a member of the Hankley Common Golf Club. But number two, when I was mayor of this borough, I did a weekend, a long weekend of conservation visits. This is extremely off-putting, you know. No, no, I appreciate what you're doing, but, uh, you know, to have everybody sort of moving around and talking. Right. So <laughs> this is going to be the longest declaration of interest anyone's ever done. Um, when I was mayor, I did a series of conservation visits with my counterpart from Germany. And we went to see various aspects of conservation. We went to Pepper Harrow Church. We went to Busbridge Lakes. And we went to Hankley Common Golf Club. We went to the club where we had tea and sandwiches from the upstairs room. And we could see out over the 850 acres of heathland that the club uh, owns, as far as I can recall. Certainly the golf club doesn't spread to all of that. We had our tea and then we went out on in separate vehicles to have a look at the conservation projects that this golf club does and continues to do with Natural England. Because Hankley Common, for those of you who don't know, has both wet and dry heathland. This is a very rare habitat and one that we as a borough should be seeking to protect and enhance. The club has had stewardship, as far as I know, for 125 years. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. No, I'm going out of the room. And all I'm going to say, the, it's only taken so long, Councillor King, because I've been interrupted about four times. But what I was going to say was, the reason I am leaving the room is because I have said publicly that I think this is an inappropriate use of a TPO. We are in, in danger, or put it this way, it's in it's danger of precedent, precedent on, for the heathland management that I think this borough should be doing. And I just think this is inappropriate and I should be leaving the room while you discuss it. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Um, on item, whatever it is, item 9.102448, Chapman House in Meadway. I know one of the um, objectors very well, known him for many, many years. It won't actually stop my objectivity, uh, but I need people to know that I have got a, uh, a non-pecuniary interest. Any other declaration of interest? Oh, Councillor Keane. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to declare a non-pecuniary on the same application as Councillor Rubini, in that I know two of the neighbours adjacent to Chapman House. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? OK. 
Okay, right. Uh, questions from members of the public? Kim? None received, Chairman. Questions from members, Kimberly? None received, Chairman. Oh. Chris, any relevant updates to government guidance or legislation since the last meeting? Uh, no, thank you, Chairman. Right. Well, that brings us on to the main elements of tonight's meeting, and the first item being the TPO 13 stroke 21. We'll come and get you, Councillor Coburn, when it's over. Kimberly, I'm not going to be able to see the screen. Well, 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 come on now. Um, okay, it's to consider the objection to making of a tree preservation order TPO 13 stroke 21 and to determine whether the order should be confirmed with or without modification. The report has no direct source implications. There are environmental benefits in retaining the tree, which merits special protection. Um, we have the officer to present, which is Ian Brewster, who is online, I believe. Ian. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for me to allow my, me to present this to the committee. And I will share my screen, if that's OK. Thank you. Right. Okay. So we have a uh, uh, an oak tree in the golf course of Henkley, and regarded as a significant tree with good visual amenity from footways and public access rights of ways across the. Um, not across the golf course, obviously, but around the golf course and various other places. Um, um, what what we have here is uh, pictures of the tree during the summer and the winter time. I think the summertime probably best portrays it as a significant feature. We're looking at probably around about 120 to 150 year old tree, which is growing in a grassed managed area not actually the heathland so i'll just click onto the photographs which will help demonstrate if i can do that hold on <clears throat> this is taken in the in the winter time not too long ago probably about a month or two ago showing the the form of the tree it's uh it's a typical windswept uh, individual tree there with the crown gathering a taper naturally from the south to the north. This was taken with the golf club to the back. And there's a gentleman there who's trying to show the scale of the tree, but not quite because he's slightly forward than the tree is. But we were looking at perhaps around about a 10 to 12 meter high uh, tree. And you can see it's, there's, it's clear of other trees near to it. So it stands out as, a, as an individual tree with good, good form. Um, branches around about two and a half to three meters where it spreads. And then you have the main um, scaffold branching and then petering off. So I don't think it's ever been pruned. So you're looking at a tree that's naturally grown in the environment with very little intervention pruning wise. Um, showing its natural shape. <clears throat> Let's just go to the next slide. That's the base of the stem showing where the tree is actually growing in, which is a managed grassed area, not a heathland uh, setting as such, unlike some of the trees in the foreground, sorry, the background and to the right. Um, believe there's a concern with roots are protruding through the grass but that's going to happen with a an old tree like that anyway so we just have to manage that by raising the soil levels or doing something which wouldn't harm the tree this is the tree in the summertime with the clubhouse behind again showing full form um, healthy tree good canopy cover lots of leaf cover uh, separated from the grassed areas so if you wanted to hit a golf ball underneath that it might catch the lower branches but um adds a bit of interest to anyone that plays <laughs> plays the game um and again we have a tree looking at it from towards the 
golf club house. I believe that was taken from the uh, the footpath itself. So as you can see, it's quite a quite a large tree. Very little uh, uh, competition from other trees near to it. So it stands out quite proud. The aerial view shows this tree as an individual. There, you've got wood woodland to the west of the tree, an individual to the east, which appears to be in the heathland there. So it would be subject to um, concern with the Natural England and Forestry Commission suggesting that these trees can be invasive. Um, whereas the T1 tree is actually growing within the grass managed area of uh, which the golf club maintain. And just to the north of there, you've got a strip of woodland as well, which is uh, acting as a, a screen, a barrier. I guess from the uh, those that play um, golf, I'll go slightly down so that I can get. Um... Okay, so what 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 I've done is I've looked into the um, the actual um, the 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 golf. Uh, we're looking to uh, change the setting to manage it to to change the overall layout in accordance with a. Uh, uh, let me just a a type of golf area which is with regard to a braid and um, original design. Yeah. So uh, and and what I've done is I've 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 managed to look at some of their their designs, braid and. Um, Oh, it should be in the detail there, but please forgive me. I've, I've got the one name there, which is mentioned in this clip. And it does actually talk about uh, having, having trees in a landscape setting that provides a bit of interest to those that play golf. Um, this is a, an extract from a website that I looked at earlier on just to find out where the trees are actually a cause of um, a, a, an obstruction to the playing of golf and it describes a last sentence there that says um it's a demanding four par, par fours and a tough par three closing hole the 20 221 yards slightly uphill beechwood which is played to a plateau green with rough bushes and sand and trees all around to pressurize the final tee shot of the day so i presume that that's something that actually is is of interest to golfers and this was taken from a place up in Scotland, uh, central Scotland called Aloha and the uh, based on a design by James Braid, which is mentioned in one of the objections um, to the um, to this TPO. Um, I can run through the various objections if that would provide some kind of uh, reason behind the objection, if, if I may. Um, with the objection, I've tried to I've tried to pick out the salient points to try and condense this so that we don't go on too long about this. But uh, we're, we're the, the, the first objection talks about uh, too close to the green. This is the tree. Its roots and debris disrupt the playing surface in the critical playing area on and close to the green. Well, that was that's not a reason that we would refuse a TPO. The quality of the grass surface is diminished compared to other greens on the course because the tree tends, sorry, the tree roots remove necessary moisture from the grass growing area. That's a, not a good reason to not confirm a TPO. Um, the current elevated design of the green is incong incongruous with other greens of the course and inconsistent with the much valued braid colt style of design. By removing it, we can restore important elements of the original design and present the green in its full glory while protecting the heritage of the club. My response was, is, according to the aerial photograph, there are a few significant trees near to the TPO oak, T1. Prior to the course design, the tree had existed within the golf green with an age of at least 100 years. Due to its individual status, the tree can be seen from a wide viewing angle its removal would create a significant adverse impact upon the landscape and for this reason does not constitute a sufficient reason to not confirm the tpo and uh, the other objection is the immediacy value of the area is of 
an open heathland landscape, the immunity value will not be compromised by the tree's removal. And my response is due to the height, the size and solitary existence within the heathland golf course setting, the oak tree can be seen at good distances from many areas, including public and accessible footpaths. For this reason, the oak is considered as having a significant visual immunity and worthy of protecting. Uh, the other objection, the tree has no significant historic value over and above many other oak trees in the locality. My response is the tree is visible with a broad spreading crown habit characterized by the historic lack of competing trees. It will become an iconic veteran if allowed to grow, given appropriate maintenance and soil improvement. TPO trees do not have to be associated with significant historic values to be considered for protection. And it goes on, the tree is not a particularly notable specimen. Well, as I've said be be um, before, it's a significant tree in the landscape. The tree removal has been debated and consulted with members of the club with the balanced opinion favoring the tree's removal. And what I understand from the actual uh, objection, 65 club members consider the tree worthy of, protection, of retention. Opinion may fluctuate depending on the desire of the club members. However, TPO trees provide immunity to the general public to enjoy, including those who are not associated with the club. For example, walkers, cyclists, horse riders, and others using public accessible byways and footways, and their numbers are likely to exceed total club membership. Uh, the, the other objection, there is an absence of clear criteria for the order to be confirmed. Uh, that what uh, We can use a system called Tempo, which is a tree evaluation system for protection orders. Uh, this wasn't carried out in this case, but I don't think that uh, it would be um, a, a quantified value that would not be considered uh, for the tree not to be worthy of a TPO. Um, and they are the main reasons of the objection. Um, so I'll end with the uh, relevant de development policy and legislation that this that the TPO relates to, Town and Country Planning Act, Section 198. And the policies, NE2, the Waverley Borough Local Plan, Policy 6, and the criteria that affords the tree protection with regard to its condition, uh, its contribution to the public immunity, uh, the appropriateness of the tree to its surroundings and the amount of tree cover in the area and the historical significance of the trees and or rarity. Um, with that, I'll end to say that we, um, we have considered all of the objections, but we still regard the tree has good value and we would recommend that the TPO be confirmed without modification. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members, you will note that um, on your desks, you have been provided with four photographs. Um, this was requested by the objector. Um, th these photographs were submitted as part of their objection, um, and they felt that it was, would be relevant for you to see the photographs as they will probably reference them in their objection speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Right, we have a uh, public speaker here, David Chapman, who's a presumably who's online. David, online? Someone? Okay, you have four minutes, uh, David, to present your objection. Hello, um, it's actually David Thomas. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, good evening. Uh, I am captain of Hankley Common Golf Club. Uh, I'd like to start with giving you some context. Uh, Hankley owns the 850 acres uh, of which the golf course occupies some 160 acres. The rest is leased to the Ministry of Defence. I say that, uh, this because several websites quote uh, the land is owned by the MOD. Uh, we manage the area hand in hand with Natural England. Hankley is designated a site of special scientific interest, as well as both a special protected area for birds and a special area of conservation, ensuring conservation of habitats and species. 
Along with Thursley and Frensham, it comprises wet and dry heathland, valley bogs, and broad-leaved and coniferous woodland. I mention all of the above purely to emphasize that we share a passion for our heathland and its conservation, and to see our rare species thrive. The golf club was born in 1897. Indeed, it is our 125th anniversary this year. When the course was laid out, it was entirely heathland with very few trees, and given the amount of land we manage, we want to balance our heathland with our woodland. In working with our course architect, that theme of conservation has been paramount in maintaining our heathland heritage. We wish to revert to the original course design and neither the tree in question nor the raised green fits with that design. Turning to the tree itself, and this is a key point, the overall amenity value, I would draw your attention to the photograph of the fourth green, the one with the tree immediately behind, adjacent to the green itself. You will see behind it a row of trees, including a number of oak trees, which run alongside the public bridle path. With these in bloom, it is very difficult to see the subject tree behind. Indeed, the oak tree to the far right, as you look at that photograph, is almost the size of the subject tree. I have also illustrated the same view in the next photo with the tree removed. You can see clearly the continuous line of trees I mentioned. As a result, the amenity value of the subject tree from a public perspective is in our opinion minimal. Uh, turning to the amenity of value of our members, of which we have over 800, uh, I have already outlined our desire to maintain a heathland balance alongside natural England. This includes the views over the course, and here I've further illustrated in the remaining two photographs that you have, views looking to and from the clubhouse with the subject tree removed. Again, I would highlight the oak and other trees generally shown in both photographs. Hankley Common is highly regarded in the UK by the Royal and Ancient, often referred to as the RNA, which is golf's governing body in many parts of the world, including Europe, and also by the English Golf Union and Surrey County. We attract thousands of visitors every year, and a good percentage of those stay locally, bringing valued revenue to the area. These visitors come to play a wonderful golf course and the tree detracts from the quality of that experience as the fourth green complex demands improvement. We aim to attract a greater number of visitors into the future and look to host further national events. In addition to the English Amateur Championship and Men's Home Internationals hosted recently. Should the tree be removed, we would commit to planting a further 10 oak trees across the general common. And if you felt it appropriate, we would welcome Waverley's Council alongside Natural England in defining where those trees should be planted. In conclusion, we would respectfully request that CPO be removed. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Um, right. Um... We have Councillor Julia Potts, who's a local member, who wishes to speak. You have four minutes, Councillor Potts, and four minutes at the end, if you so wish. Councillor Potts. Thank you very much, um, Chairman and members, and thank you for your time this evening. I, um, I should stress, I've picked this up slightly late. This was a matter being dealt with by the late Councillor Adams, so um, I'm uh, going from uh, various correspondence and so forth, so forgive me. If I don't cover every single point at this stage, I'll take the potential of four minutes at the end. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's fair to say that TPOs do serve a very important purpose. However, I think we'd all agree that they need to be both balanced and proportionate. And the matter before you this evening, members, really is a, very much a matter of judgment. The recommendation itself is that in the interests of conserving character and amenity of the area by retaining statutory control over the future pruning and felling of this mature tree. Well, amenity itself, and this is from the government's website um, on, uh, on trees and tree TPOs, isn't defined in law. Uh, so authorities and yourselves will need, as I say, to exercise a judgment when deciding whether it really is 
right and within your powers this evening to make such a, such an order. It's absolutely crucial that you have an understanding and have had the opportunity to digest the very, very complex but detailed facts and pertinent facts to this situation uh, emphasised this evening and spoken eloquently by Mr Thomas. It is complex, as I say, but we are talking about an incredibly, incredibly sensitive heathland habitat. We're very fortunate in Waverley that we have three of such habitats and it's important that we do everything in our power, whether it's um, it, with, in respect of this oak tree or, or far wider and far more reaching um, actions to preserve and enhance this sensitive triple SI heathland habitat. The club, as we know, is of some 120 years standing. They've worked tirelessly with Martin Ebert, a renowned expert in the design of links and heathland courses throughout the world. And examples of restoration that we have within Waverley, our own borough of woodland and um, other uh, landscapes back to the all important heathland habitat can be seen at nearby uh, RSPB site in Bourne Woods in Tilford and at places like Blackheath Common near Wanosh. So it's not unheard of to actually take what may to some of you seem like somewhat dramatic action to actually make sure that you restore a habitat much longer term. That is what the golf club want to do, working with Natural England, working at, as they often do also with the Forestry Commission. They want to preserve this for generations to come and we should be doing all we can. And I would urge you as members to be thinking about this. We should do all we can to encourage this. Returning to the public benefit, I think the key point I would emphasize is the economic development aspect. The golf club, as you know, is a championship course, renowned both nationally and internationally with a thriving youth academy. The economic benefits to the local community in terms of jobs, hospitality, revenue, are enormous and should not be underestimated. We mustn't put that at risk in any way. And that needs again to be a matter that is considered as part of the judgment, the planning judgment in this matter. I have to say, I find it disappointing when you read the report that we seem to have um, an anonymous I've got to give out four minutes now. Thank you. We have uh, an anonymous person. Yeah, so, you know. Uh, uh, councillors, who is she talking to? Ah, Councillor Molyneux. I wonder if I should have declared an interest as I am a golfer and I have played Hankley Common a number of times. Um, I'd start off by saying I have great respect for Mr Brewster as a tree officer but I think we are very much in the realms of competing opinions because I had been told, and I see it in the papers, that a similar application for a TPO had been made to Waverley over a year ago when a different tree officer, I think it was Mr. Clout, was in place. And he was of the view it was not appropriate. And the main reason I believe is that it's because it was a woodland tree in a heathland setting. Mm -hmm. And if we could possibly have the um, screenshot showing tree T1 viewed from above, it might be useful for my next point. Could the officers kindly organize that? Ian, could you show the map with TP1, please? You're muted, Ian. You're muted, Ian. Sorry. Uh, okay, share my screen. Here we go. I believe it's that. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I say, perhaps having the advantage, if that's what it is, of being a golfer, um, I'd like to 
take gentle issue with Mr. Brewster of a couple of things he said. First of all, um, from a golfing perspective, the tree does not offer interesting challenge. It is completely inappropriate to be forced to, to play through it and round it, and in particular for all the muck that gets dropped onto the green at regular intervals. It is extremely close to what is undoubtedly Heathland area. We're talking a matter of yards, and acorns can certainly be blown on the wind enough to start seeding. And indeed, from that point of view, if you didn't have a ground staff who were making sure it didn't happen, then this would be a naturally invasive tree relative to the Heathland. Um, the entire course is basically on, on Heathland, and I really do think it's a bit artificial to say, well, this is in the artificially grass-managed area. It's actually very close indeed to, gen to genuine Heathland grass. Um, there's an artificiality which has been forced on the golf club over the years to raise that green. It's only the way it is because they've tried to basically hide the roots and the roots keep on coming to the surface. So I agree with Councillor Potts. We're talking about a balance here. Um, we've just had a weekend when I think Waverley itself has lost 50 trees. I've lost one in my garden. It's sad, but they happen. It's part of the natural process. And of course, what you do is to plant more trees and if it hadn't been mentioned by the club captain, I'd have said myself that the obvious thing to me anyway is to be prepared to not confirm the TPO, to let the club do what it and Natural England and the Forestry Commission prefer and to improve the, the golf course, but put at least, as it recommended, 10 more trees where they would be suitable and would add to the amenity. I should say that having come up the fourth fairway a number of times, you don't, when you're standing on the tee, think, gosh, what a lovely tree in the foreground. It's completely um, masked, if you like, by that it's part of a pano panorama. It's only when you get, you get close to it and you find you've got to spend about five minutes brushing the green clear of leaves and bits before you can take a, take a putt. So I think on the, on the balance of advantage here, um, there are an awful lot of trees around. Um, there are a lot of oaks around. I'd be very happy to see more oaks planted in a, in a suitable place. And on balance, I'm not in favour of the recommend recommendation. Um, I'll listen to what others have to say. But to me, the arguments in favour of allowing the golf club to do what they, they prefer seem to be stronger than simply holding out for this particular tree. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Edmonds, then Councillor Nicholson, and then Councillor Deer. Thank you very much, Chair. The critical issue for me is the integrity of the tree. Taking uh, guidance from planning inspectorate appeal decisions, I really need to understand whether it's a professional opinion which confirms the tree safe. Without that uh, assurance, then I certainly would not support a tree preservation order. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Nicholson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I, I do understand the objections. However, this is a, a prominent, attractive and mature tree. It has a full symmetrical uh, specimen and it's right outside the edge of the golf course. So then given the nature of the tree, I would uh, think it's worth keeping and I would back the proposal. Councillor Deer. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Good. Um, well, in contrast to the re other reports we have in today's papers, which are models of uh, reason and objectivity, I must say I struggle a bit with this one. Uh, it seems to me saying that we need to tr preserve the tree because it's a tree. Um, it doesn't seem to present any sort of balance case, uh, just a series of uh, double negatives or, you know, not constitute reason not to confirm. I think, I think the burden is on, uh, of proof is on the, the need to, to confirm it. Uh, it doesn't seem to me a rare species, um, which is one of the criteria. It's not in a conservation area, clearly, because it's in the middle of a common. It's not historic in any way, as far as I can see. It, there's little or no public amenity from uh, the tree for the tree. It, the removal will, wouldn't have any effect on the character or landscape of the, uh, the tree, of the area, because there are millions of other trees that all look to me reasonably well managed from the satellite photographs and the hard copy photographs I've seen. Um, However, it would inhibit the, the economic and sporting activity of the club, which I think is to be uh, avoided. 
And it seemed to me the captain, Mr. Thomas, was, was a very impressive witness who came up with a practical solution. Uh, it improves the, uh, the amenity of the club. It has virtually no effect on any other amenity. And we get 10 extra trees planted as a result. That would seem to me that everyone's a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Rubini. Hey, Chairman. Uh, like Councillor Mulner said, I should tell you I used to be a golfer. Unfortunately, no longer because the joints don't allow it, but I've certainly played painfully. Um, I'm in two minds on this. The attraction to golf for a lot of people, like myself, was to actually take on the challenge of a golf course. And yes, this is a challenge with a tree on a raised green. And indeed, I've played many courses where instead of a tree, you get large water courses in front, the side, and all over the place, which limits the uh, amount of places you can drop your ball into. So I am in two minds. However, it looks to me as though if they took that tree down but replaced it with many more trees, then I could sympathise with that, particularly in the recent time when we've lost so many over the weekend. So I can see the benefit of actually putting in more trees instead of one single oak. Yes, there is a footpath running around, as I see it, within view of that tree. So we will lose that vision. However, it's been pointed out, there are three or four other oak trees around the perimeter. So I assume they will give a similar sort of vision. So I think on reflection, I would probably back the captain because he did speak well in saying that they are going to preserve the area for national um, reasons. And as far as I'm concerned, and I, I would trust their vision. And if they work with natural rendering, et cetera, then I would agree that perhaps that tree should be removed from where it is. It is 100 years old, which is a shame. But on the other hand, things do move ahead. So I think I would be removing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor there, but Chris, do you want to say something? Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the I think the, the difficulty you've got here is that the focus does have to be on that particular tree rather than the, um, the replanting. I don't believe there is a mechanism that will allow for it to be conditional on replanting, for instance. Um, the um, Ian Brewster is on um, is on on the Zoom, and actually, I could just do with him clarifying that that what I've said there is um, correct as, as the tree officer. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. It's uh, unlike a planning application. You can't allow a tree to be felled. You could replace it with a, with a tree had it been, if it was TPO'd, you could replace it with one tree or you could place it with, with more than one tree. But it has to be a uh, similar species in the same location uh, as opposed to a condition that would require uh, a trees to be planted elsewhere within the triple SI site. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and Ian, just for coming to Councillor Neil, uh, Councillor Edmonds asked a question, actually, and uh, I think he deserves an answer. What, with regard to safety, it, uh, if, it's, if it's withstood the storms of Franklin and Eunice, then it must be a healthy tree. I couldn't find any fault with the tree looking at it when I was there visiting about a month and a, a half ago. Clearly the tree in winter, when it's winter bare uh, 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 appearance, uh, shows no sign of any dead wood or any bro broken branches. So it's in, a, it's, a, it's, it's in a good, healthy condition and uh, long may it continue. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Mulliner, um, and this is just my perception, but um, the, the, um, when you were speaking earlier, it, it appears that you have quite an intimate knowledge of the golf course. Um, and could I just suggest that you do declare a non-pecuniary having that kind of interest in the golf course, please? Um, I did actually say at the start that I wondered whether I should, but I think it's taking it to an extraordinary level when the fact I happen to play golf and I happen to have played, played that course, and I do remember the whole, should amount to an interest. I was quite clear as to why I was saying it, and I think that I'd say, I think you're going too far, to be honest, and perhaps we should discuss this with, 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 with Robin Taylor. The interest procedure is important, but I think there's a danger of taking it too far when we'll end up having to say that we've 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 walked past a, 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 a planning site a few times, or we've spoken to someone who turned out to be the owner. I think there does have to be a sensible limit as to what we declare as a genuine interest. Thank you, 
But let's discuss that later. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Councillor Neil. Thank you, Chair. Uh, now, when I first saw the papers on this, my natural reaction was to say, well, this is a wonderful tree, healthy, in just the right setting, because it needs big space. Um, why would we want to remove it? Or why would anyone want to remove it? So you immediately say, well, why can't they move the, the tea? <laughs> and I'm not sure if they've really answered that question um, because there's a lot of land there. But um, moving on from that, um, in general on this business of trees, I'm of the view that um, you know, if a tree does need to come out, and it's usually we're talking about uh, alongside houses and things, then um, a bit of tolerance is needed, you know, if we're going to replant other trees, um, all trees have a natural life and they come and go, especially in storms. Um, you know, a bit of tolerance is needed. Um, take this one out, put other ones in, in place. Now, the, uh, the golf club has said that they are prepared to plant other trees, and I think we can probably rely on their integrity to, to do that. If not, their, their integrity would go down in our eyes. Um, so I think, you know, there is a, a, an argument here for giving way to their needs as they see it and maybe the economic benefits of doing it. Um, so I'm moving the other way towards saying, well, let them uh, remove it. But um, I'll listen to other members before I make up my final mind. Thank you, Chair. James. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, normally, I would be agreeing with the officer. It's a lovely tree, and when you look at the picture on its own, it, it, it looks as though obviously it is worthy of it. But then things move forward. All, all the maple trees um, on the A3, half of them had to come down because we had to have a dual carriageway. It, if you're going up to Oxford, new roads up there, the lovely trees have to come down because it's progress. Hankley Common is a Hankley golf course, obviously is an international golf course. And if it has to have a certain kind of a golf course, going back to its original um, design and the trees in its way, um, then progress moves forward. And I'm afraid I, I will not be supporting the officer this time and um, the tree will regrettably have to come down in my view. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Merlees. Thank you, Chair. Well, I agree with our case officer. Um, we have a commitment to biodiversity. We've just spent a long time looking at our tree preservation, and what, what, what trees we're going to keep, our, what green spaces. And um, I'm very sorry that we have so many people who are more interested in what they call progress, as opposed to the trees that, and all the, the, the natural things that we have. It's not a... It, it, it's, to me, it's like euthanasia, and that may sound a bit sentimental, but, you know, a hundred-year-old tree that has managed to weather the storms and, has, and, and is beautiful is, to me, something that should be preserved. And I'm sorry if somebody has to go around it. After all, the golf course was a natural heathland before they turned it into a golf course. So that will have moved out a lot of the animals and wildlife in the first place, never mind that it was over a hundred years ago. So I'm very pro-keeping trees, wherever they may be, unless they are actually falling down, causing a serious problem to buildings or anything like that. And I think that it's a shame that so many people think because they want to play a game. And after all this, golf, this, this, this as far as we can make out, Hankley is doing very well. Um, I don't really feel that, you know, the removal of one tree is going to make a huge difference to the amount of people who are going to go and play there. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very much committed to keeping the tree. And I hope that people will recognize that we want to retain these things. They might be slightly in our way, but they are beautiful, they are to be revered, and they are to be protected. Thank you. Yeah. And Councillor Keane? Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, I would like to support what Councillor Merrilees has just said. Um, to my mind, this is, it is a beautiful tree. It's very old. Um, I could understand it if it was a rotting tree and had to be taken out, but it's not. We've been assured of that. Um, I don't play golf but um, I can understand what the golfers are saying, but um, I believe that the tree should be preserved. After all, it is 100 plus years old. Um, and not to forget, we're in the Queen's green canopy this year. 
So it would be very um, wrong, I feel, to be chopping down a tree that is 100 plus years old and in very good health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Hess. I'd like to make a declaration of no interest at all, because I've, I've never played golf in my life, um, apart from crazy golf, and I didn't do that very well. But um, it, it's a beautiful tree, um, and it's interesting, actually, coming in here tonight, I, I was quite, quite conflicted about it, probably alongside others. Um, I think my view is that um, the game of golf should go round it, and the tree should be allowed to stand. It's a beautiful, healthy tree. You know, I've, I've got a situation in West Street in Farnham where there's a lovely weeping beech, which is destined um, to be felled. And I'm really, really sad about it, but I'm not opposing it because it's got disease in the trunk. So eventually it could pose a danger to pedestrians and property. So there's give and take in these things, I understand that. But this is a healthy tree, it's an oak tree, it's, it's our national tree. Um, and I'd be very sorry to see it go. So I think it needs to be protected. And I think golfers need to kick away the odd acorn, put up with a few twigs and go round it. Um, I know it's an important bit of the economy. I know golfers are passionate about their game. But um, hey, you know, a few obstacles, you know, get on with it. But let's keep the tree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, let him come back. And I won't rehearse any arguments, there's no point in that. But I thought, I mean, obviously, uh, Mr. French here has said we can't condition any of this stuff, which is uh, clearly the case. But just as a matter of procedure, I was wondering if um, if we invite, you know, given that there is an offer for 10 new trees as part of the Queen's Green Canopy, which is in advance on where we are now, whether there was a, a way of um, asking for an undertaking, a written undertaking from the club to engage with Natural England and, and Waverley with regard to the su supply and location of 10 new trees within a certain period of time. If failing which, then the, the tree preservation order could be reapplied for, I would have thought. Uh, as I say, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to um, engage in the argument, simply as a matter of procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think that's possible, actually. But I mean, nevertheless, uh, right, Councillor Potts, do you want to have four minutes to sum up? Chairman, thank you very much. Um, yes, I think just to, to re-emphasise, this was a Heathland course. It isn't a full heathland course at the moment because there's a tree uh, that we know on, on it. And the work, just to be clear, that the golf club want to undertake is to ensure that the whole of the course is and reverts to, with their work and the conservation work, a heathland course. And with all due respect to the pictures shown earlier by the officer about a course in Scotland, that wasn't the same type of course at all. So that wasn't applicable. In terms of replanting and planting additional trees, that offer has been made by the club. They would be more than happy to enter into a, any form of legal agreement if that was felt appropriate. And in terms of trying to work collaboratively, which it, I have to say is a shame that that hasn't happened at this stage. As I say, anonymous tip off as it were, one officer saying one thing and then a year later, another officer making a different decision. What would be helpful, I think, um, is that, and a lot of help has come from the debate tonight, is that um, we actually pause this process and um, we actually sit down with the club so that we can actually understand what is happening, what is being proposed and the full details of their management plan and why they want to go that route. Because I think it's really important, um, given the impact and the size of this common within Waverley, given yeah. all the economic benefits, but actually given this is extremely sensitive habitat, that we are actually as, you know, all working together, the, the club, 
the relevant officers, as well as people like Natural England and the Forestry Commission. We need to be working together because the club and, and its habitat will be there for many, many generations to come. And in my view, we need to look at potentially doing something like that. And if members do feel that that might be a more appropriate form of uh, moving this forward, I would be more than happy to facilitate such a meeting. But in the meantime, what I would urge members to do is carefully consider what we've debated tonight. The club are not developers. They're not trying to just tear down trees willy-nilly. They want to return to the natural heathland habitat. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ken Fox. I believe that uh, Zach Elwood wants to comment. Uh, just, just very briefly, and I won't enter into the debate about the merits of the TPO or otherwise, just to clarify a couple of points. Um, yeah, I appreciate Councillor Potts is trying to come up with a sort of like a suggestion of a, a reasonable way forward. But, but the fact of the matter is we have to determine um, whether or not to confirm this TPO within six months of the date it was served um, and to come back to a later committee, unfortunately, would be beyond that six months. And after that six months has expired, um, the tree could be could be felt. So it really, we really do need members to make a make a decision tonight, one one way or the or the other. I'm afraid. Um, I, I think that's um, that that's the main point I was going to say. There was a comment about whether or not we could have some sort of written agreement. I mean, I th I think what we, sh we we should accept is that if the if the decision is that the TPO is is felled, I think we we, we should take the word of the, the golf club, but they will be good for their word. I don't see any mechanism for entering in, into a, a legal agreement or or conditioning that. I think they, they're on, Mr. Thomas is, you know, he's spoken eloquently, he's on the on the call, he's heard what's been said. And I'm sure if uh, the club wasn't true to their word, I'm sure there would be some backlash, uh, certainly from members and the community. So I'm not going to make a comment on the, the merits. You have the officers, you know, the, uh, Mr. Brewster's professional opinion. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, uh, I would ask that, you know, that's very carefully considered, but ultimately it, it is with, with members. And, and I, I do think you need to make a decision tonight, I'm afraid, councillors. Thank you very much, Mr. Elwood. Well, 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 this is, a, this is an interesting case. Well, I think we'll move to the recommendation. Um... The recommendation is recommended at Tree Preservation Order um, 1320 21, applying to a single mature English oak on land owned by Hankey Common Golf Club, Tilford Road, Tilford Farm, GU10 TDD, be confirmed by modification. Those in favour of confirming the um, TPO, could you please raise your hands? Against? Abstain. What's the vote, Kimberly? Thank you, Chairman. We have four is four is five. Five of of four confirmation, eight against, and non uh, abstaining, Chairman. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, uh, just, Guy, do we have to give a reason for not confirming this GPO? Does anyone wish to suggest any wording? Sorry, I wasn't quite clear. Um, if yeah. we simply refuse to confirm the, the TPO, then I presume it just falls falls away, does it not? I mean, advise we have to give a reason. Is that right? Well, um, I think from the discussion I've had, the the reason is largely to do with the kind of the balance of um, the impact on uh, the, the the club in term, and the um, against the retention of the retaining the tree. So kind of economic um, and um, feasibility arguments um, was why it's not expedient to make the, the, the TPO. Can we invite Kendra Corbyn back? Chairman, could I just ask that, Louis, um, that our solicitor makes a comment on yeah. what the process is? Louis, is that okay? How can yeah. I forget you, Lewis? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I think Chris has summed it up quite well, but but uh, I think it is useful to encourage 
members to give reasons for their decision um, in the same way we do for uh, uh, situations where members are uh, going against an officer's recommendation uh, for, for, for a planning application. But as far as I can tell, they seem to be um, uh, uh, taking issue with the expediency um, of, of confirming the TPO rather than the uh, amenity value of the tree itself. So I think that's probably been made sufficiently clear um, uh, by, by members and, 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 and officers already. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Well, I can use that. That, that was a pretty tricky one, that was. Um, right. Now we move on to applications for planning permission. And the first one is uh, somebody before we speaking, WA 2021. 1024, so it's 02448, land at Chapman House, Medway, Hazelmere, GU 271NN, for the erection of extensions and alterations to the roof to provide seven dwellings and associated landscaping works following partial demolition of the existing storage building as amended by plans received on the 3rd of November 2021. And Philippa, to present the case. Thank you, Chairman. Um... Great. Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, members. Um, the application proposes the erection of extensions and alterations to the roof of Chapman House to provide seven dwellings. It also includes associated landscaping works following the partial demolition of existing storage building. A key consideration for this application is the principle of development. Prior, appro prior approval was granted in 2021 for the conversion of the existing office to 14 dwellings. This permission is extant and could be implemented with or without the current application. Officers would note that the application must be considered as per the plan submitted and on its merits. So I'd just like to give a verbal update. So prior to the publication of the agenda, 18 letters from 15 addresses were received raising objection. Following re-notification prior to the meeting and since the publication of the committee agenda, there have been six further letters from five addresses making objection, which I've summarised here, but I, I won't read out for you. Um, whilst I've summarised them here, they have not introduced any new concerns to those raised previously and those reported in the committee report and the officer recommendation remains for approval. Turning to the location plan, the application site is on the the corner of Meadway and Timber Mill Court. It comprises a two-storey former office building with a long narrow projection and car parking. The surrounding area is predominantly residential, but the site is a short walk to the shops and services of Way Hill and Hazelmere. Turning to the aerial photograph, we see the existing building and car parking, and it, the site is accessed via Timber Mill Court here. Um, Going to take you through some photographs um, just to note that officers have carried out a number of site visits to the site. So photographs from both visits have been reproduced here, but I have focused largely on the, the earlier ones, which benefit from the lack of site hoarding because it gives you a better view of the building. So this photograph is taken from the west um, looking along Meadway, as is this one. This photograph is taken from the southwest, sort of within sort of the, ac the existing access looking towards um, the rear of the building. Here you can see the existing projection. <clears throat> this view is taken from the north. Um, <coughs> this is the rear of Oak End um, and Chandos is here. So this is showing the, the elevation that's closest to neighboring properties and the tree that is subject to TPO is here. Um, this is um, taken from the northeast looking towards Chapman House, and this is the garden of Oak End and the TPO tree that I just mentioned. And this photograph is taken from the west, again looking towards the, the projection and the existing building and the existing car park. So here we have the proposed site plan. Um, the the area that would be demolished is, is here, which would be returned or created into amenity space. Um, here is where the three-storey extension would be located. Um, the car park would be reconfigured. Um, there would be a bike store provided here. There would be a bin store provided here. 
and there are some small modest areas of um, amenity space provided around the building. Right, turning to the elevations, the, the next few, few slides show a comparison of the existing and proposed elevations. Officers would reiterate here that the prior approval permission is extant and could be implemented as per the existing elevations. So here we're looking at the northern elevation. A few things that I would note, um, there's a reduction in glazing from the existed, existing scheme. So the existing scheme would be implemented or could be implemented, sorry, with this glazing as, as it is. Um, there's a reduction in, so as I say, a reduction in glazing from the existing scheme. Existing brickwork would be repointed and made good and areas of it would be rendered. This is the southern elevation. Again, we see the, the changes to the, to the elevations, including the additional story. This slide shows the eastern elevation and we see, see the extent of the um, existing projection, which would be demolished. Um, I think this slide really clearly shows the reduction in glazing. Um, and this is the elevation that would face Oak End and Chandos, which are the closest um, neighboring properties. So there's a significant reduction in glazing on that elevation. And this is the Western elevation. Again, we see the, the significant reduction um, of that projection. And again, a, a significant reduction in the glazing on this, this elevation. Um, turning to this slide. So these are the approved floor plans um, of the prior approval, which could be implemented. So I appreciate it might not be the easiest to see, but you can see that there is the extent of the glazing that is already there, which would face the neighboring properties. Um, particularly at first floor of the approved scheme, we see there are large windows which serve a bedroom and the kitchen diner there and a bedroom here, which would face the, the neighboring properties. So turning to the uh, proposed floor plan. So this is the ground floor, very similar to the site plan I showed you earlier. Um, in terms of the first floor, we see a significant reduction in, in glazing on this elevation, which faces the nearest neighbors. Um, this would serve a bathroom, so could be purely glazed. Uh, this window does serve an amenity space, but as I previously mentioned, there were significantly more windows in that elevation previously. And in terms of the proposed second floor, there is one window proposed in the eastern elevation facing the nearest neighbors, which serves a bathroom, which would be conditioned to be obscurely glazed and fixed shut above 1.7 meters. So there would be no sort of views from that, um, from that window across the neighboring properties. Um, you'll note that there are some terrace areas proposed. Um, officers have recommended a condition be attached to any approval, which requires the submission of a scheme to ensure that there would be no material harm by overlooking and loss of privacy. Um, and this, this area here would not be accessible. So turning to the matters for consideration here, as I've said, it's a material consideration that the prior approval for 14 units approved in 2021 could be implemented with or without the application under consideration. In terms of design and impact and visual amenity, the current building lacks architectural merits with limited discernible features. The proposal would seek to add articulation, it reduces the extensive glazing and improves the material palette. The proposal would add bulk and mass, but the proposed extension would be set back um, from the elevations, ensuring it would not appear unduly prominent with the additional floor set in by 1.5 meters. Um, we must assess the application as submitted and officers consider that the proposed alterations would constitute an improvement to the existing appearance. With regard to residential amenity, as I said, it's material consideration, the prior approval could be implemented. Um, the existing building features extensive glazing, including that in the eastern elevation, which, which faces the closest neighbours. The current application reduces the glazing throughout the building, including in the eastern elevation. In addition, no further habitable windows are proposed in this elevation. All separation distances to neighbouring amenity spaces and habitable windows complies with the council's residential extensions SPD. 
with regard to highways and parking, the application site is in a highly sustainable location and the County Highway Authority raises no objection to the access and egress or to the level of parking provided subject to the compliance with a number of conditions. Turning to the matter of trees, um, following some objections raised, um, any works proposed to the neighbouring oak tree subject to a TPO would need to be considered via the appropriate application to the council. It's not unreasonable for a neighbouring occupier to wish to seek works to a tree. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Philip. Right, we have public speakers on this item, and the first one is a Sam D. Who is still... Sam D. Is she online? I hear you. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Sam, you got Brilliant. Four minutes, Sam. Thank you. Um, I'm an immediate neighbour of Chatton House, speaking this evening to represent many fellow neighbours with our concerns about this application. At the outset, I want to make clear that we feel this site is well suited to development and we support the converting of a disused eyesore into homes for our community. Our objections are not simply replies of the usual not in my backyard type response. This is about the quality of the design, the size, privacy, and of course, the, the destruction of protected trees. There are many other things that could be done on this site to provide amazing homes, flats or houses, but this particular application does not satisfy a range of issues. Although the community is keen to arrive at a suitable design and thus offer support for an application on the site, the developer has shown no desire to engage or work with us. And this fact seems to have been missed from the officer's report. I wanted members to know that this evening. Three things I want to highlight this evening, Mr. Chairman. Number one, Chapman House is ugly. You've just seen it. It's desperately out of keeping uh, with the neighbourhood here. However, what is currently proposed is only an extension to the ugly building in both width and height, in, and height with a design and material not seen anywhere else in our immediate neighbourhood. This would not be an, an enhancement, quite the opposite, in fact. Just because the main part of the building is already awful doesn't provide a basis to make it worse. This committee presided over the applications for nearby Kathleen House and Armory House with their fitting design of tile sides and roofs, which have enhanced our neighbourhood. The plans on this application are cheap and completely unfitting in our streetscape. Design alone is a strong reason to object tonight. A Lippmann test here, Mr Chairman, would be for members to ask themselves, could I live in the shadow of this? Number two, Mr Chairman. Notwithstanding the views expressed in the officer's report, the fact remains the applicant is proposing an extension to the roof, which is overbearing on neighbours and with terraces overlooking other private amenity space. This should not alone be acceptable. And finally, number three, the applicant proposes significant reduction of a grand oak tree, which has a TPO. This provides great visual amenity in our road. The tree currently has large limbs bordering Chapman House, uh, members uh, uh, can, I hope, see the officer's report is very light on detail here, but the reality is that in order to squeeze an extra tier on the building, the tree will be entirely cut back on one side and never able to regrow or reach its future potential because any growth would conflict with the proposed roof extension that you've just seen. The officer's report also misses the fact that detrimental works are being applied for here around the root base with the construction of patios. Members will also see from the application that no full description or proper justification is provided for destroying these trees. This committee spent a lot of time trying to protect our community's mature trees. Indeed, this council previously determined these trees were important enough to warrant legal protection. This application completely undermined those protections. I can attest with photos to the many species who call these particular trees home. Uh, tree one that you saw there is in, the, is in my back garden. No extension to this building should be permitted on the basis of damage, both immediate and future to the TPO trees. In summary, Mr Chairman, for members to, to vote in favour of this application tonight, I feel they will be voting in favour of setting a precedent that allows anyone to build what they like, where they like, no matter what it looks like. They would also be voting to dismiss the privacy of private amenity space and to ignore the concerns of our neighbourhood. Finally, any vote in favour tonight would be voting to reverse the protections previously afforded to our much loved oak trees, voting to destroy them. In closing, Mr Chairman, I conclude that our neighbourhood has overwhelmingly objected this application. We ask members to work with our community tonight by also rejecting it this evening for the valid reasons I've just described. Bye. Bye. We have a second public speaker, who is Billy Clements, who is speaking in support of the scheme. Billy Clements, is he online? 
I'm indeed. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can hear you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item on behalf of Ellswood Homes. Uh, as set out in your officer's presentation, our current proposals for Chapman House complement the earlier grant of the prior approval to convert the vacant offices to create 14 residential units. The proposals seek to make efficient use of this sustainable brownfield site by adding sensitively and carefully designed extensions to provide another seven much needed new homes. The proposed extensions to the building have been carefully designed to respect the existing building in terms of form, scale and massing. The side extension and roof addition have both been set back, providing subservience and ensuring that they would not appear as dominant or prominent features within the street scene. We welcome your officers' conclusions that the proposed extensions would be in keeping with the design and proportions of the existing building. In addition, by setting back the side extension, We've also created space to introduce new planting and landscaping within the public realm, which will help to significantly soften what is currently a very barren and urban appearing site dominated by large areas of hard standing. Through the application, we have also sought to take the opportunity to refurbish and up upgrade the dated external fabric of the building. I think both acknowledged by the officer's report and the objectors, the building is of limited architectural merit at present. It lacks any, any real features and the works we are proposing to the external elevations, which would not otherwise be secured by the prior approval, would make a significant enhancement, adding articulation, interest, balconies, all of which will positively contribute to the appearance of the building and the character of the area. Furthermore, the upgrading of the external fabric and windows of the building will improve energy efficiency and additional balconies will create amenity space. We have been careful to design our proposals to ensure that they are respectful of neighbouring properties, mindful of the predominantly residential setting of the site. We have listened to feedback from your officers during the assessment of the application, and this is reflected in the changes we have made to the window and balcony positions, particularly at the roof level and on the northern flank of the building. These positive changes will further enhance the amenity of neighbours. As recognised in your officer's report and as stressed in the presentation, the building presently has extensive glazing with a ring of windows at ground and first floor which encircle the building. Implementation of the prior approval would result in many of these windows serving habitable rooms and the amenity impacts of that are clearly a material consideration. However, the elevational changes we are proposing through the current application would result in a significant reduction in glazing facing towards those neighbouring properties particularly on the northern elevation closest to neighbours with Lyon Mead. We strongly believe that the proposals would deliver an overall betterment for amenity of neighbouring properties when compared to the current situation. Overall, we welcome the comprehensive analysis of neighbour amenity set out in your officer's report, which clearly identifies that the proposals would not give rise to harm to amenity of neighbouring occupiers and also complies with the relevant requirements of the Council's Residential Extensions SPD. We recognise that developments such as this are sensitive and understand the views of neighbouring properties. However, we firmly believe that the scheme appropriately balances the pressing need to make efficient use of previously developed land in order to deliver much needed housing with the important aims of responding to local character and preserving the amenity of neighbours. As I've set out, our proposals aren't simply about delivering more homes. We are looking to take the opportunity to enhance the appearance of what is acknowledged to be an ugly or a bland building, and also the energy efficiency of an outdated building, helping to breathe new life into this vacant office building for years to come. We are of course mindful of the protected trees adjacent to the building. There are no new foundations close to the trees and the works proposed in terms of um, patios can be achieved without harm to their rooting environment. And applications- uh, sorry to interrupt you, we've had four minutes, I gave four minutes to the other speaker, so thank you, uh, so thank you very much actually. Members, who wishes to open the debate? Ah, oh, Councillor Rubini. Thanks Chairman. Yes, yes, I know this area and yes, I know several of the people within that area. Um, and of course, we've all seen the number of letters of objection to this. I was concerned when the original application came through, that this is one of these modern permitted developments that the government say, if that's an office building or a commercial building, 
then it automatically more or less gets planning permission to put houses on that site. And as the applicant himself says, it's an ugly building. I agree it is. I would ask the officer before I continue, because I want to say more, I can't see any mention of affordable or social housing. Is this included in this or what's happened? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Rubini. Um, it wouldn't meet the threshold in order to be required to provide affordable housing because the scheme is for seven units. Thank you. And, and I think I've said this before. I know we mustn't relate this to other applications. My problem is what a good idea to add numbers together in separate applications. Um, and therefore you don't need these affordable units. I, I'm very concerned that we're getting applications like that, that to my mind don't add up. Anyway, to, to continue, yes, this is an extension upwards. I personally would have no objection to the side, side elevations, if of course they were retained at a two level medium. That would not be out of keeping. It would still allow further building. However, to plop this third extension on top of an ugly building and then say, oh, it's all right, the profit we can make out of this will refurbish and make the other one look better. Well, why have we got to put up for that? Well, why can't the developers actually do it in the first instance? I don't understand why they're developing ugly when they could, as the developer says, actually make it a good looking building. So I'd have had no problem with the PDF if they'd actually made it look as though it was some sort of building that claimed merit. The moment it doesn't and it won't, I don't agree that by putting the third story on the top, that is going to allow the amount of money to do that. So I'm sorry, I would oppose this. The other area, of course, is parking. Yes, I understand that it's close to the railway station, the amenities, but we all need vehicles. And, and I, I do not like the idea that in a very crowded area, and believe you me, there's very, very little parking in that area, it's already used up on the streets that we can just plonk something else in and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter about parking. Um, if they want to get to Hindhead, tough luck. The bus over there is infrequent. And where else do you go to from that particular location? You either have to walk, have cycles. I know we're in a green emergency. I know I like sustainable areas. That could be sustainable if we put the side extensions on, but I don't think we need the roof. I think it's overdevelopment and out of character. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, Councillor Edmonds. Thank you very much, Chair. Four questions, but I'd like to start with the planning inspector's comments. Planning conditions can enhance the quality of a development and enable development to proceed where it would other otherwise be necessary to refuse planning permission. So these conditions must be met for the development to proceed. So my first question is, how are these planning conditions to be monitored and enforced? The second question is, what discussions have taken place between the LPA and Hazelme Town Council? It's essential that we take in local knowledge when we come to planning decisions. This is often ignored. What are the, sorry, what are the county highways conditions? And the final question is, is the development exempt from a fire statement? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Nicholson, then Councillor Deer, then Councillor Keane. Nicholson. Ah, thank you, Chairman. Well, as I see it, there are four main factors. The first is the style and mass of the building. Then there's the overlooking. And then parking. And the loss, fourthly, the loss of an important tree. Working backwards, the, this is an attractive tree. It's very prominent in the street scene. This would be a definite loss. Moving to parking, well, here we have the number of places which is required between Waverley and Surrey differ. It's not particularly helpful, um, but this, of course, is in the middle between the two. Um, parking is very tight in this particular place, and uh, residents will have visitors, and there is very little spare parking at nearby roads at present. I mean, I've made a number of uh, visits, including one tonight, very little spare parking there at all. Uh, moving on to overlooking, that, that was a very much general concern, but I think the officers have worked quite well here. They're looking at a 1.8 metre <coughs> screening. That's my height, so that's a fairly significant height for, for screening, and they're going to distribute windows and 
the I think the developers have made and the officers have made some work on this and have tried very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the main point, however, is the style and the mass of building. I mean, it's a major point. This is a 90% size, three-story building. It's a significant increase. Um, it is, it, it's, it's set back, but it's still significant. Um, the nearby roads are Lion Mead and the larger part of Timber Mill and Meadway. They're all two stories. And if you drive down Meadway, and this would be a three-story, it would very much hit you. Not pleasant. Um, so my view is a three-story building would not fit in. It would just be too large and, in this instance, also too ugly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Deer. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, well, as uh, the objector very articulately expressed, um, this is awful. Um, but they can build awful. They can get on and do awful straight away. Um, but what's being discussed here is an improvement on awful. And to my way of looking, it's a substantial improvement on awful. Uh, it breaks up the elevations, it reduces the windows, the fenestration, uh, and it, it becomes far more a uh, far more of a, a residential feel to it than the office uh, appearance that it has before. I mean, this is presumably what you used to call a non-conforming user in this location. Um, having been round, as many of us will have been and looked at this, um, the privacy distances seem to be very comfortable. That's a matter of technical fact or not but they seem to me uh, it seems to me a large sort of island site miles from uh, many other uh, uh, occupied uh, properties you know really su sufficient distance there um, and uh, the, the one thing I do have a reservation about as Councillor Rabini touched on is the uh, extent of parking um, th these things are to always a matter of judgment to some extent but this seems to me the very very bare minimum that the development could get away with, but I think it's probably just about acceptable. So, as I say, taking the fact that we are where we are, I mean, I, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't be where we are now, but we are, and we have to live with that, and we have to consider material planning considerations and the fact that the tilted balance is engaged in the bar, as it mentions in the report. Uh, I think we have little choice, really, but to go with the officer's recommendation for the reasons they have so eloquently described. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Keane and Councillor Molyneux. Councillor Keane. Thank you, Chairman. Well, um, sadly, um, this is a very ugly office building. Um, I know it well, as do all her fellow councillors in the area. And, and to my mind, the developer has given very little imagination to integrating this building into its surrounding areas, which it is a very, very attractive area. Armoury House made every effort to, um, to make their development fit in. These developers have not. Um, I am very concerned about the balconies, the third tier. Um, obviously, if you have balconies, it encourages people to be out in the evenings and therefore you could have noise and, to, and loss of privacy to the neighbors. I can't agree with Councillor Deer that it is away from the other, the other residences. I have had a look and to my mind, it is very close to the other residences. And I feel there will be a loss of privacy to those neighbours. And even though there is a reduction in the windows, I still feel that it will cause light pollution. We have to remember that this was an office block, it closed in the evenings and there were no lights left on at night. So therefore there has to be light pollution. Um, I don't object to the side extension on this development. I think that would not harm anybody, but I do believe that at the moment, I cannot support this application. Um, apart from the fact that we're going to, they're going to possibly cause damage to the oak tree. And there aren't very many trees in that road. And, you know, we have to remember that if you've got a, a nice tree in, a, in an area, you want to keep it. And I, and I do feel that any work on that tree is going to damage it beyond repair. The parking is abysmal. There is absolutely no parking. I tried to park there a couple of days ago, absolutely impossible. And this will only add to that problem. And the neighbors already tell me that if they have guests visiting, parking is impossible. So for those reasons, I really cannot support this application. 
And, and by way of, of just to explain, Hazemere Town Council did object to this application on, for many of the reasons that have been outlined this evening. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, I can't recall one of those things before. Can't, can't, okay, okay. Councillor Morner. Right, right, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I wasn't offended, Councillor Chairman. Um, uh, yes, I. I'm quite surprised, actually, to hear um, so much negativity about this. Uh, I have to say, when I did my own site visit, and I'm knowing the area anyway from before, um, I thought this was so much more of an improvement to the building. Um, uh, yes, I appreciate that it's going up in height, but, you know, where in Hazelmere are we going to put buildings if we don't intensify what we've already got? Um, we don't want to touch a single blade of grass. I mean, at some point, reality has to dawn and you have to put the housing where housing can fit. And it's not going to be perfect wherever it is. And, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't put another dwelling anywhere near Hazelby, but we, we don't live in that world. We have here an extant permission, which we can do nothing about, <clears throat> which will do nothing to enhance that building, which is quite frightful. Um, you know, you, you look back in some of the buildings in all our towns and wonder how on earth they ever got permission and whether or not in those days they didn't need permission, I've no idea. But you do look at them and think, well, how could anyone have ever thought this was a thing of beauty? So we have a really nondescript, ugly building that can develop without any say so from us, or we can go for this enlargement, which I think is a, a huge um, uh, advantage over the other one. Um, I think, as I think Councillor Deer put it so well, you know, it's got an interesting frontage with the fenestration. I just think it's um, so much more of an um, improvement to what is there now. I appreciate all the arguments of parking, but they apply in every site such as this. Um, it would be nice if we could really put down markers and, and get more, and, and I've said that for years, uh, that we always, whenever we're doing our parking requirements, it always seems to be too few for those of us that live in the real world. But given where we are, given what's on offer, given the situation, I think this is an improvement on what's on offer. Believe it or not, I am worried about the tree. Um, but, you know, I think we have to work round all these issues if we are going to um, improve our, our delivery of housing, which we so badly need. So um, I actually support this one. Thank you. Well, Councillor Molina. Thank you, Chairman. If I can begin with some questions, I find some aspects of the report unclear. The first is, um, are we to conclude that if the existing permission, the PRA, is to be implemented, there'll be no changes to the external appearance of the building. Well, my feeling is that's not relevant because um, whatever someone does to that, they will want to sell the units. And I can't, I can't think of anything less attractive than simply trying to sell flats, which are basically a reconfiguration of a very industrial site. The parking does concern me, and I'd like to be clear about that. Are we, we are Waverley, not Surrey, so I think we're entitled to use our own parking requirements as the measure. How many parking spaces are there actually available? Um, I find the table on page 33 extremely hard to follow and I'd be grateful for some help. But if you turn to that, um, we see listed um, what our requirements are and what Surrey's are. And then we have these three we have 19 and then 31, but then parking spaces proposed are 14 and then 26. I mean, how many spaces are physically available? Because the building on top means by definition, you're not changing the area of the surrounding curtilage, which is where the parking is. So how many parking spaces are there, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Muller. So uh, apologies if the table isn't clear. It was, it was meant to set out what was approved and provided under the prior approval and what is proposed with, with this application. Um, and the Waverley requirements would be 
31 um, spaces, which takes into account it not being classified as town centre, even though it's 150 metres away from designated town centre. Um, Surrey would require 21 spaces, um, but those proposed are 26, which includes two disabled parking bays. Um, and I, I would take this opportunity to reiterate that the County Highway Authority have reviewed the application and have commented specifically on the parking and have raised no objection. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm not actually any clearer. What, this, what the parking space is proposed under, under the current proposal, sorry, not the current one, the PRA, are 14. And that's going to be up to 26. What I want to know is, looking at the area available, how suddenly do they provide an extra 12 parking spaces? I mean, is this new land or is it the old land? Because, frankly, I'd expect that the number of parking spaces couldn't, wouldn't actually change and that if 26 are available under this proposal, they'd also be available under the PRA. But am I missing something? Thank you. Um, well, they are demolishing part of the existing building and re reconfiguring the site generally after demolishing that. So there has been a general reconfiguration of the, the wider application site. Thank so, you. Do, so do I understand that there's a degree of demolition in this application which would not be there under the, under the, the PRA? Yeah, there's an existing um, sing, long single storey projection, part of which would be demolished as part of this application. Yeah, I mean, I still find it hard to believe anyone would actually leave that there if they were serious about trying to sell, sell this. I think my feelings are that the parking does seem to be inadequate. Um, I know the area well. There would undoubtedly be leakage out into, into the roads. Um, the idea that people will buy here, I mean, 150 yards from the, or metres from the town centre is a long way. I can remember an application <laughs> in St Christopher's Road, which was a great deal closer to the official boundary. And there the inspector was sympathetic to the, to the applicant. But 150 metres is really quite sufficient. The fact that people might not need a car does not mean they don't want one. And people want to travel wherever they want. They don't want to be reliant on, the, on a fairly light bus service or the, or, the, or the rail service. So I think one has to look at what the car parking needs really are. And that's the part of this which I am concerned about. Um, if we've got our own requirements, then 26 is not as good as 30, 31. And I don't believe we're obliged to subordinate our own requirements to those of Surrey. I am concerned, though, about the tilted balance, um, because this does seem to tip the scales firmly in favour of the applicant. And if we refuse, we then promptly get the risks of a, yet another appeal. As to design, um, I'm not sure I'd put it quite the same way that Councillor Deer did, but it's clear that to make a long rectangular building attractive does take a certain amount of effort. But I say I'm not convinced that if we refuse this, that'll mean that the existing building will be left as it, as it is. I can't see how anyone would sell anything if it, if it was. So I'm in that unusual position where I am absolutely on the edge. I'm not sure yet which way I'm going to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> well, um, I think I'll pick up on page 24, which is Hazemere Town Council's objection. There's a lot in there. I'm not going to reread it, but they object. They are the local town council, um, so I, I respect their view, their local view, their local knowledge. But for what it's worth, I'll just add my two pennyworth. Um, a fellow member mentioned that the uh, existing building is awful. Well, the scheme for 14 flats looks awful. The proposed scheme for 21 is even more awful. And another member talked about intensification. Well, where you can avoid affecting residents that live nearby, if you don't have to intensify, then don't. The developer has already got approval, 
require approval for 14 flats, but clearly not satisfied with that. That's not going to generate enough profit. So they're going to max out on it. But in so doing, there are overlooking issues, even with screens, I believe. I believe it would be overbearing to neighbors. The flat black clad roof is absolutely not in keeping. We've discussed insufficient parking and the possibility of overspill into neighboring roads, problem. Destruction of trees with TPOs, not acceptable. And the existing building is brutal and unattractive. The additional element will just make a bigger brutal building look even bigger. And it's not in keeping with the neighborhood I wouldn't personally want to live next to it. So I wouldn't vote to inflict it on the people that live nearby. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Neil. Thank you. Um, a couple of observations. I think the officers or the report says that um, the surrounding area is all two story. Well, when I look at Timber Mill Close on Google, and there are elements of those buildings, which are three story, as far as I can see, which is adjoining this site. So maybe that's not quite the right story. Um, I must admit, I'm not um, very keen on the roof line of this um, third story that they want to put on top. It's a pity it's not a pitched roof in some form to match in with the rest of the area. If they had a, a pitched roof, are there, which obviously would reduce the number of units on the top. Um, it would look a bit more in keeping, I would have thought. Um, so there's a couple of comments on the design, really, to add on to the things that other people have said. Um, thank you. Yeah, any other councillor wish to speak? No. Oh, well, all right, Kevin. Are you like uh, upon information about timber mill? Uh, most of Timber Mill is two-story. There is a three-story part of Timber Mill, which is at right angles to this development, and a further small three-part further over. But the majority is two-story. Is two it feels two-story, although, as I said in my piece, it is a major part of it is two-story. Okay, Thank you very much. Thanks. Right. <laughs> um, a quick question, actually, the officer. Um, I'm one of the classic not traps, but mistakes we can make on a borough planning committee is to let other people's judgment um, swamp our own. We have to make up our minds. I just want to be one clear of one thing. Um, can the officer confirm that as far as our overlooking guidelines are concerned, this, this application does or does not conflict with them? I think you said that it didn't. Thank you. Yeah, so if I could draw your attention to page 30, 30, yes, of the um, officer report, I've set out, um, actually, a big one, it might be 31, sorry. Um, so I have said, with regard to uh, Timber Mill Court, Chapman House is 19 metres from the boundary. Um, the additional story would be set further 1.5 metres in, that would comply with our residential extensions guidelines on um, overlooking. And similarly, with regard to Rex Court, which is further away, uh, 23 metres is the closest dwelling. So very much in compliance with our residential extensions, SPD. Thank you. No, I wanted to be to be clear because um, one of the things we ought to do if we're going to vote, vote to overturn is to be clear of the policy reasons before we actually vote. Um, and I'm keen to clarify that that was not one of them which we could use. Thank you very much. Right. We'll move to the... Sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chair. Um, is the tree officer here? Has he made an assessment about this, a proper assessment? Thank you. Um, no. So the tree... The, the applicant would have to submit an application to do any works at all to that tree. It's not their tree. They, they would have to submit an application which would have to be assessed through the, the proper channels as to whether any works that they would wish to, to have done could be achieved. They could also do that for the current prior approval if they were in, in, 
if they were to implement that and they wish to seek um, some reduction in the crown of the tree, they could seek approval to do that now. Um, the, the additional story is set further in from the tree. Um, and there was a query earlier about patios, but there, there's an existing um, outbuilding at the rear of Oak End and um, the build that there wouldn't any any sort of patio work would not disturb the ground hugely, and we could con add a condition requiring the submission of tree protection details should should uh, members uh, wish, which could control that element of the proposal should should we wish to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I know that when I had my extension done, it cost me another two thousand pounds to protect the tree, but I, I and I am. Very keen to do that if we with all our developments. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We have four, four, uh, sorry, five, four, <laughs> five in favour, yeah. six against, and three abstentions. Recommendation that uh, we wish to propose on. Can I suggest it's some um, overdevelopment? There's the problem of the view and overlooking adjacent properties. There's the matter of the tree, um, because that hasn't been mentioned here about preservation, um, and the actual design itself. Oh, and parking. Sorry, Chairman, we've just been told about the space difference and the tree, so we can't put those down as reasons for refusal. We can put a condition in. Yeah. Chairman, the proximity to the buildings in the me in Meadway is far closer than it is to Timber Mill and Rex Court. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Chair. I'm just looking at wording now. Thank you. Chairman, you do need to have someone move. Chairman, um, sorry, I, I know I'm online, but I've got my hand up. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Howard. Um, yeah, just thank you, Chairman. Just just a brief reminder to members, and I'm sure you're all aware, but where we refuse an application, we have to have defendable reasons for you know defendable reasons with evidence for each and every refusal reason. So I, I would urge some some caution in terms of some of the advice you've had, particularly around the, the, the tree, essentially the overlooking um, issue in our policies. So, um, you know, it is a case that, you know, if we even if we won an appeal, we can lose costs, have costs ordered against us if we put in reasons for refusal that have to be defended that are not reasonable. So uh, that's just something for members to bear in mind. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. I think we're waiting on some, yes. Is that? Hazelmere Town Council have cited some policies here in their objection. Proposal by way of scale, mass and design would result in a cramped and overdeveloped site failing to take the opportunity for improving the character of the area, harm to the area and out of keeping with the streetscape, contrary to policy TD1 of the local plan part one and retain policies D1 and D4 of the local plan 2002. They also go on about amenity. The proposal harms the amenities of neighbouring occupiers by way of overlooking, loss of light, during the day, light pollution at night, overbearing an outlook contrary to policy TD1 of the local plan part one and retain policies D1 and D4 of the local plan 2002. And it goes on, there are further policies quoted um, 
concerning on-site parking, but I don't know whether that's enough. Thank you, Chair. Isn't it? Uh, right, Councillor Nichols and then Philip. Well, thank you. I, th I think Mr. Elwood's uh, comments are absolutely right. I think we have to really look at the, the, the main reason why we want to, to uh, not for this to not to proceed, and it is a scale mass and design. And I would say scale mass and design only. Other things matter, parking matters and the tree matters, but they could be picked off. I think scale mass and design is a very strong reason to refuse this. And I think this is a this is a common thing in planning. Let's not have too many reasons why we do want to have it, but let's have a few very strong reasons. And I think that one, as mentioned by the Hazelby Town Council, simply by itself is a good and strong reason. I think we should stick to that. Thank you. Philippa. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I would reiterate, Councillor Nicholson has basically said what I was going to say and that um, I would, as Zach said, steer you away from residential amenity and trees and, and stick to um, scale bulk and mass um, it, when forming your reasons for refusal. Thank you. Who? Oh, Councillor King? Councillor Edmonds wishes to say. Councillor Edmonds, sorry, I apologize. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to read out policy D4, design and layout. The Council will seek to ensure the development is of high quality design. This certainly isn't, which integrates well with the site and complements its surroundings. Right. D, D1 and D4 is fr are frequently mentioned by planning inspectors. Right. Okay, Chris. Um, thank you, Chairman. I, I think um, at one point it was read out, but there is a, um, a reason for refusal, which is the first bullet point that Councillor Nixon was reading, um, that, that as she does have D4 in it as, as well. So um, we could use that, um, that wording on, on reflection. Chairman. Philippa, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, that's what I was going to say as well. Thank you, Chairman. Well, a refusal. Who's going to propose a refusal? Well, Right. Okay. And then... thank you, Chair. Um, so I would suggest the proposal by way of scale, scale, mass, and design would result in a cramped and overdeveloped site, failing to take the opportunity for improving the character of the area, harm to the area, and out of keeping with the street scene contrary to policy TD1 of the Local Plan Part 1 and retains policies D1 and D4 of the Local Plan 2002. Thank you, Chair. And for that to the vote, those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against? And abstain. Oh, yeah. Is that combined? Yep, and abstain. Abstain. Could we do that again because that, no, those numbers didn't add up at all? Uh, Against? Abstain. Thank you, Chairman. So that's six in favour, three against and three abstentions. Could we have a comfort break for a couple of minutes? Uh, uh, yeah. Been going two hours. I can't cope with more than two hours. Uh, yeah, fact, two minutes, Mr. Kansas.
And that is, that is WA 2021 The land at Sturth Road is on my GU 273SE. An application under section 73 of WA 2018 0275 to very condition one to allow changes to footprint, road and slab, uh, slab levels, layout, including position of substation and design, including alteration to house types. And everybody's bound back in, in, in the room. So, Officer Rachel Lawrence to present the case. Chris is presenting. Sorry, sorry. You're not Rachel. Right. Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks permission for material amendments to the Reserve Matters Consent WA 2018-0275 by way of varying condition one to allow for changes to the footprint, road and slab levels layout design for 132 dwellings on land at Sturt Road. Um, I've got two, two verbal updates um, for you before, uh, before we get into the details. Um, so, um, firstly, there's um, the number of spaces referred to um, in the update sheet. Um, we've we've done a, a, a second check of that information, and actually, the um, the number of spaces that's being actually been provided on that parking plan is two seven seven against the requirements of two seven four. So um, they're actually exceeding the the guideline now. So um, I know that in the update sheet it refers to it being uh, one below, but actually they are um, they are three three spaces above that guideline. Um, the, um, the the second uh, the second point is the description should be referring to seventy uh, three a um, rather than seventy three. So um, that's just a um, an, an update due to the that's part the seventy three a is due to um, the retrospective nature of some elements of the proposal. Um, this is the location plan. The application sites outlined in red, um, located to the the south of. Um, Sunbrow and to the east of Sturt Road. Um, uh, it's this area here. The, this slide shows an aerial view of the, the site. Um, and you can see that um, yeah, some of the site clearance had begun at the point that aerial photograph was being, um, being taken. Um, but, um, but at that point, yeah, that, that is the, the, the site here that I'm um, highlighting with my cursor. Um, here are the, here's the existing consented layout. It comprises of a central spine road um, and a number of cul-de-sacs um, off of that road. So this is the consented reserve matters layout that we've, um, that we already have in place. Um, and this is the proposed layout. Um, the internal road network stays the same. Um, there's a number of the detached units would be replaced um, with semi-detached units and the flat, some of the flatted blocks, two of the flatted blocks would be removed. Um, and those in, in those areas, you'd have a, um, a mixture of semi-detached and, and terrace properties in, the, in their place. Um, the footprints of the built form is very similar. Um, and um, the areas where the flatted buildings were before, I will get, I will go a bit closer in, in and, and show you in a second, um, but um, it's, here and and here and there's a, um, a substation which is now proposed in the corner down the bottom here and this is a closer look at um, at the front part of the site you can see that the only significant change um, in terms of layout on this kind of front part of the site is the uh, in the introduction of the the substation to the to the south here Um, and this plan shows the rear of the site. So the flatted buildings were uh, here and here and here. Um, and the there were a number the, the other the other significant changes that there were there were a number of detached units at the back part of the site um, that are now semi-detached um, units and a uh, and a, a terrace building. Um, this is the indicative tenure distribution plan. It shows the shared ownership units in blue and affordable rents in red. And there's a, a right to buy um, units within the um, rent to buy, sorry, units within the uh, flatted building at the center of the site. Um, the scheme actually secures 100, sorry, secure, secures 39% affordable housing via the 
um, the 106 agreement. Um, and therefore, whilst the applicant has now indicated that the remainder of the scheme would be brought forward as additional affordable housing, this cannot be factored into the balance as an additional benefit in planning terms, as there's not a mechanism to secure that additionality. In terms of design changes, um, I've got a series of sections here that I will run through. Um, the top of these sections is the extant consent, the existing um, permission, and the, um, the, the slide below, um, or the section below, is the proposed development. So what you can see, the, the significant, what you can see is the majority of the buildings remain the same on this section. Um, the flatted building would be replaced by um, a pair of um, a pair of semis and a, a terrace building um, that would also tie in with the existing uh, tie in with the with the other units on the site. Um, and again, here at the top, you have the original consent. Um, and below, we've got the current proposal. Um, the, the buildings remain well designed, well proportioned, um, and the materials would um, be of a, be. Of, you know, the same quality as was consented before. Um, this is to the rear of the site where the detached units um, are replaced with the semi-detached units. So um, you can see the, the extant consent at the top um, and the proposal um, below. It gives a good indication of the spacing that remains around those buildings. And this is the central part of the site. You can see the majority of the dwellings do remain unaltered. Um, so again, as before, we've got the extant consent up the top and the, and the proposal below. And you notice that the, the dwellings have been adjusted for the, to deal with the change in levels. So they no longer have a uniform uh, ridge heights. Some of them uh, now show a stepping, stepping down in line with the levels on site. And this is towards the back of the site. You can see the existing consent on the top with the slide below showing the proposed, um, the proposed dwellings. Um, there are levels changes when comparing the existing extant consent uh, and the current proposal. In order to achieve a more gradual slope across the site, the levels are proposed higher than previously consented um, and smaller retaining walls are therefore um, proposed. So um, there's a section there on the left. Um, the, the property with the, the floor and ridge heights raised the most um, compared to the extant consent is uh, plot 21. Um, the flank of that building fa faces towards 21 Sunbrow um, and would be approximately two meters um, compared, higher compared to the previous consent. Um, with that distance between that between the dwelling and 21 Sunbrow and plot 21 being approximately seven, 17 meters, and due to length of the neighboring yeah, the neighboring garden and the um, and the change in levels, um, officers are of the view that there wouldn't be an overbearing um, a overbearing impact. So, and um, what you can see in the slide to the on the right hand side there is that. That building that would be higher than consented, and the the, the fact that it backs onto um, backs onto a, a garden, um, a, you know, a garden that's between sixty and seventy meters of of distance between the flank wall of the proposal and um, and and number twenty one. And this, these are some photographs from the site. Um, you can see the change in levels from, from, this, from this photograph. And the properties that you can see on there are the properties within Sunbrow. And again, on the left, you've got the properties in Sunbrow taken from within the central part of the site. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that photograph is looking um, towards the southern boundary. And this photograph on the left is looking at the internal spine road. And the photograph on the right shows where a, um, a temporary drainage um, solution has been put in place whilst um, construction is under underway. And this final slide shows the uh, the main matters of consideration and you know, those are the matters of design and character 
uh, layouts and parking um, and the impact on neighbouring amenities. Um, for the reasons set out in the officer's report, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Chris. Right, we have two public speakers, first being Chris Story, who is an objective, who I believe is here. Here was, yes. Yes, it's you, Chris. It's uh, Chris. When, when you know, in your own time. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you. Included within approved planning application 0275 is a detailed construction environmental management plan, including drainage system to be installed before any house is built, protecting Sturt farmland natural water course from increased storm water runoff and consideration of the presence of important aquifers under Sturt farm. This management plan has been ignored, the land bare stripped leading to extreme local flooding, causing planning breaches, WBC enforcement were told about, but breaches were ignored. Developers initially were working under the 0275 planning and decided because of flooding to change the consented plan in 0275 by filing seven months ago, section 75 attached onto 0275, planning number 02027, changing housing types and other major changes replacing 0275 configurations. Waverley visited the site approximately four weeks ago, and did they not observe foundations were very different on the ground than 0275? Did anybody question developers, supervisors on exactly what planning number are they adhering to? 02027 is being built without being approved by WBC. Several months ago, developer supervisors told locals 02027 has been approved stating 100% affordable houses currently being built. Several workers stated it was approved within one week of filing, yet 02027 is still pending, not approved. 02027 was taken objections online since July 2021, specifying no closing date. However, a closing date has recently been added when two councils were made, made aware of this January 2022. 02027, include ma significant major changes from 0275, number, types, design, plans, elevations, and mix of houses entirely different. Treating these differences as minor amendments to previous planning approval of 0275 is inappropriate. Locals dismay at the way this development is being executed, outstanding issues for the future well-being of people, wildlife, and safety of properties, Immediate concerns relate to scale and depth of earthworks, risk of flooding caused by climate change extreme storms, increasing threats to Hazemir's water supply from future extreme droughts and increased water demand from Sturt Farm development, not to mention increased wastewater disposals. WBC has declared a climate emergency, therefore mitigation measures must therefore be robust. We can find no reassurances about safeguarding Hazemir's water supply. We are objecting to 02027 because it is a major departure from a project that has already received full planning permission with safe CEM plan. Because of the significance of these major unclear changes, they need to be incorporated into a separate transparent planning application on which there is meaningful consultation with the public. In the meantime, we call for all work development at Sturt Farmland site paused. A formal, transparent internal and external investigation is of high priority in this matter, given the content herein. 0275 is no longer viable as current building construction not adhering to 0275. On this basis, therefore, section 75 of 0275 application 02027 is null and void. Very much. Thank right, you, the second public speaker is Marie Reardon, who I presume is... Marie, you have four minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to speak in favour of this application. 
so I work at Stonewater and Stonewater is a leading social housing provider with a mission to deliver good quality affordable homes to people who need them most. We manage around 34,500 homes in England for over 76,000 customers, including affordable properties for rent and shared ownership, alongside specialist accommodation such as retirement and supported living schemes, domestic abuse refuges, a dedicated LGBTQ plus safe space in young people's foyers. Our house building programme aims to build a minimum of 1,500 new homes a year, driven by our vision of everyone having the opportunity to have a place that they can call home. We plough our surplus into building new homes, improving our existing housing stock and investing in customer services. We're committed to providing homes that are energy efficient and are working towards government's targets for carbon neutrality. We're dedicated to improving biodiversity on our developments and believe that ecological enhancements benefit everyone. Our development team are committed to delivering new stonewater homes across a range of tenures to meet the challenges of the housing crisis in both Waverley and across England. The team work closely with various external partners such as Homes England, local authorities, developers and construction partners to ensure our homes are designed and constructed to enhance neighbourhoods and support prosperous communities. Provision of public art and good quality public realm are key to our new developments, giving each scheme its own unique identity. As a strategic partner with Homes England, we aim to deliver additional affordable housing on our developments by utilising grant to swap market sell housing to social affordable rent and shared ownership and rent to buy homes. At Sturt Farm, Sturt Stonewater will deliver 60% of all of the homes as social rent. These are typically around 45% of the market rent, meaning these homes will be truly affordable for those on the housing list and in need of affordable housing, which we know is a real issue within the borough. The remaining 40% is split between shared ownership and rent to buy homes. We've been working closely with the housing team at Waverley on this scheme in order to help Waverley meet the objectives as set out in the Waverley Affordable Homes Delivery Strategy 2022 to 25 to help deliver 400 new affordable homes over the three year period, of which Sturt Farm will deliver 132 new affordable homes. This delivery will also serve to bolster Waverley's 85 year housing land supply. Stonewater has made the decision to change the mix of housing types across the site to better reflect the needs of the local community. We're reducing the overall number of flats and large four bed houses to provide an increased number of two bed houses. We feel this mix is better suited to the area, fit the current demand profile for affordable housing and all homes meet or exceed the nationally described space standards, ensuring the homes will meet the needs of both current and future residents. We've also been working with the team to agree how the rented homes will be brought forward. And whilst the additional affordable homes will not be fettered in the Section 106 agreement, Stonewater will enter into a nominations agreement with Waverley for all the social rented homes so that Waverley can nominate to all 60% at first let. Our aim is for as many homes to go to those who live in Hazelmere or the surrounding towns and villages. If nominees cannot be found for all the rented homes, we will then cascade to the borough, but no further. Alongside the Leap and Lap areas, as well as the Sands Land, which are all being provided as part of the delivery of the scheme, Stonewater believes that this great quality affordable housing development will be one which we, Stonewater, the council, local residents, and more importantly, our future residents will be proud of, and will go some considerable way to meeting the clearly identified housing need in the area. Thank you very much. Right on. Right, councillors. Councillor Deer. Don't say it like that, Mr Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. Yes, um, I struggle to understand the nature of this application, so I'm very grateful to our office of colleagues here and to Stonewater for... Uh, laying on a site visit the other day, which made it very clear. Um, the difference in level seems to derive uh, as a, simply as a function of the facts on the ground, uh, not tallying with the previously uh, worked on plan. So it's a, it's a matter of accommodating what the physical ground uh, uh, provides. 
And as far as the, uh, the, the alterations to the mix and nature of the property is concerned, this was uh, previously permitted as 60% affordable and 40, well, 60, 40 uh, in favor of um, market homes. As a result, as we've just been told of Homes England's intervention, um, that will now be um, entirely affordable social and the, the, the structure of ownerships. So, I mean, this is really, really good news for Hazelmere. Um, I see, uh, I see my job really here to, to support exactly what's proposed um, without any further delay. Thank you very much. Councillor Hess. Thank you, Chair. Um, I endorse what uh, Councillor Deere has just said. Um, a provision of 100% affordable housing in some form or other is very good news for Hazelmere, I'm sure. Just got a couple of questions, um, you know, because <clears throat> in, in, in uh, our enthusiasm to fall over ourselves to support low cost housing, which we need to do, um, I've just got a couple of questions that I've jotted down here really, um, which could get glossed over. Um, I remember on earlier planning applications for Hazelmere, that um, much was made of the water problems that Hazel may have suffered, water shortages. Um, and I can't see anything from Thames Water here in the papers to uh, flag up whether, whether that's um, all fine and dandy. So that's just a question really. Have they confirmed they can supply the water with no problems, 12 months of the year? Um, I'm just wondering, does the scheme qualify for SPA contribution or was that actually agreed previously at outline? That's just a question. Um, and lastly, um, why are there only 20% of electric vehicle charging points for the 15 apartments? That, that means that for 15, only three charging points are being provided and, and we're rushing fast now towards uh, 2030, when there will be no more um, internal combustion engine powered new cars sold. It'll all be electric of some type or another, possibly hydrogen by then, but there will be a lot of electric type vehicles. And I fear, you know, every time we pass um, a scheme, approve a scheme, where under provision for electric charging for vehicles um, is built in, we're just building up problems for the future where people are going to be scrabbling for the available charging points um, and a lot of people running around in electric charged vehicles that need to be charged with electricity and not finding a provision in their developments. And when you're providing a charging point for every house, semi-detached or detached or, or whatever, but you're only providing 20% for apartments, it's a kind of discrimination. It's not right. Um, it's not fair, it's not right, it's not sensible. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear an answer from the developer. Why aren't you doing 100% for everybody? You know, uh, it's just a question. Why aren't you doing 100%? Where, where are the PV panels for putting power back into the grid? Where's the grey water systems? You know, we talk about sustainability, we talk about the environment, but these developments, they lack a lot of stuff that they really should have. Now, I know they're not planning issues. I'm just having a rant. It'll be approved, I'm sure. But, you know, we're really not doing the job properly here. Um, and not just this developer, but across, across the country, lots of developments are lacking because they go cheap to max out on the profit. Anyway, thank you very much for hearing that. Thank, thank, thank you, you Chair. You, thank you for your rant, uh, um, Chris, did you want to answer some of the questions? Sorry, sir, me? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, it's another Chris. Um, 
Yeah, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, you, yes, um, Councillor has a number of the, I, I know you mentioned the, the water um, and the SPA, um, both, both of those are outlined, were, were, were considerations of the outline. So that's why um, the report doesn't, um, doesn't cover those matters, because this is a detail um, in terms of reserve matters. So those, those are definitely outline matters. I do think that the that the parking, uh, the requirement for the vehicle charging points may have also been set at the set at the outline, but I would I need to check that, and uh, um, I would need a, a little bit of time if I was going to check the decision notice on the on the original outline. Um, but um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's all I can really say for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't on the planning commission when the original was. Um, allowed. I, I do wonder at where the youth facilities plonk right at the very end outside of it, which is a shame because it means kids have to walk all the way through the estate to get to the leap. However, coming on to what they are proposing here, we had a very good site visit and I thank Chris French for organising that because it did clear up an awful lot of points that I had in my mind, including the fencing along the actual cliff face under some brow, which has obviously formed some sort of retention for their soil. I thought about the semi-detached instead of flats. I personally would always prefer sem semi-detached housing than flats. I think it's more amenable. I think most people that live in them would prefer to live in a semi-detached house than have people living above or below. So I'd be quite happy to swap those flats over for semis. Indeed, it doesn't make much difference. The footprint's very similar and you get the same number of bedrooms. The was, I was very pleased to see that they were digging the hole, a huge hole, as a temporary sort of reservoir to contain a lot of the flood water that is coming down. Now, as I understand it, they will be putting a proper tank in it so that they can control the amount of flood water that comes down off the hill. So I am pleased to see that they have at least put a temporary measure in to stop the flooding that we did see about three months ago when we had that torrential rain. So they assured me that that will actually solve that problem. The point I would make um, is about Thames water, not so much for the water coming in, and we all know Hazelmere has got a problem. I've mentioned it before and I'll mention it again, but I wasn't on the original planning. That is that I am concerned about the amount of housing going in Hazelmere and the supply from Thames water. They aren't able to cope, it's a simple fact. They did actually mention that. However, on this occasion, when I went to that site visit, they again reiterated that they didn't have an agreement yet in place with Thames to take the sewage and others away because apparently there's a problem with electrical cables across the way further down. So I need to be assured that by the time this is put into operation or whatever, the Thames Water have completed the work and will complete the work to a satisfaction that we all agree to. Because uh, of course, the bit they are talking about happens to be in Sussex rather than in Surrey. So they really will have to work with the neighboring authorities to get it put right. Thank you. Councillor Molina. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think on that last point, Councillor Rubini, um, I did ask about that. Uh, it seemed very much as a temporary technical problem, not one to be solved in the matter of hours or days, but certainly a very a very few weeks. It's just a question of taking a water pipe so it goes round um, an electrical uh, main or possibly the other way around, but they've got to get together with the electricity company. Um, the only concern I have about this actually relates to the change of levels. Now, I think I've got in front of me, which because I asked for it, which I know the committee hasn't, is a cross section and if we uh, go back to the uh, this rather useful diagram showing the comparative sections. Now, I know we saw them for the south side of the site, but do we have the similar ones for the north side? This is where you showed the two alternative views and demonstrated how little things changed, although there had been some move away from flats to semi-detached. Can you get back to that? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I can get back to anything that's on the presentation, but I don't have anything 
other than that. So hopefully you hold on, I will. Well, it's unfortunate because it's actually on the north side or the sun brow side that I think the, the problem exists. Basically, you've got clocks 21 and 22, which are very tight to the end of the gardens of number 21, sun brow. And they're going to stick two metres further in the air. And I think the separation distance from the back of the house to that is only 17 metres. And I'm not quite sure whether anything would be done at this stage, but it would seem to me that it would be a case for making whatever's going to be put on plots 21 and 22 to have the ridge heights adjusted down by two metres. So there's no difference to what was originally being con consented. Um, I asked at the time um, on the very useful site visit, which I also attended. Um, yes, it, that is, is, you've got, you can see what I'm getting, getting at. I mean, those houses are not that far from the, from, the, from the boundary and plot 21 is sticking an extra two meters up in the air. Um, and I would like to know whether we can somehow get that ridge, ridge height lowered so it goes back to what it was. I don't dispute the engineering reasons for raising the base of the slab, but I do think it shouldn't damage the amenity of the nearest occupier of Sun Brown. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, I'll come back on the other point for, that Councillor Hess raised about the, um, the electric vehicle charging points as well. We have found the condition attached to the outline, so, um, so actually asking for something further than that would you know wouldn't really be appropriate given we consented it at that time and we put that condition on so um so that's why the 20 percent has has come from um the um the other point in terms of neighboring amenity is we, I, I think we've got to consider what is in front of us now and whether that is acceptable <clears throat> not what the difference is between necessarily between what was consented um, before or, or or not so um in our in our officer's view that's that set down that change in levels makes a very significant difference, um, albeit it would be higher than it was consented before. We've got to look at what is now in front of us. And to, in our view, that doesn't cause an overbearing, um, overbearing impact. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Um, what you can see here is the retaining wall and then the gardens at the higher higher level and what i would point out from this photograph is the um you can see the retaining wall but you can also see the bottoms of the um of those houses because they are that much um yeah they are that much higher up um thank you chairman mr elwood do you want to say something uh, yes, please, Chairman. If Chris could just go back to the previous slide. Um, I just want to point out, and, and Chris did mention this earlier, but what we have in this situation between these plots, the existing and proposed, is not a back-to-back -back situation where we would expect a really good separation distance. It's a back-to-flank wall um, relationship. And, and actually, the distances are very generous in terms of back Back, back elevations of flank wall um, in this instance. Um, and so, you know, whilst I note the comments made by councillors, I, I, I honestly think the relationship is acceptable in, in planning terms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Edmonds. Thank you, Chair. Three questions. The first is, are we still talking about a maximum of 135 dwellings? The second question is, what do we define as affordable homes? My previous definition that I was given was 80% of market rate. And the third question is, there was reference to 45% market rate in terms of rent. Is there any way that can be conditioned? Thank you, Chair. Three ways to think, Chris. Thank you, Chairman. The, um, the scheme doesn't increase the, num doesn't increase the number of dwellings passed um, that was consented at the previous um, the, the previous reserve matters um, and in terms of um, the the affordable units and the control on markets uh, rents that would have been set out at the at the outline stage for the units that are the um, are the 
39 units that have those um, stipulations within the 106 agreement. So those are the ones that we have the control over. Um, and um, I, I don't know what is set out in that the in that um, in that in that agreement, but that isn't what's before us now. If that makes sense, thank you, Chairman. Sorry. So how many houses are we talking about? Two. I need the number. One hundred and thirty-two. Councillor Nicholson. Well, thank you, Chairman. Well, this is partly an engineering solution, and I think that's 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 fine. Um, scheme is a good scheme. It's uh, all social housing. I think it generally looks better. I like the housing mix, an increase of two bedroom units, moving away from flats having more for housing it certainly looks better looking at the profile it's uh, it's excellent uh, a, a plus point is the increased car park provision and also the protected buffer adjacent to sunbrow so all in all i'm very happy with it two points i did note i looked on page 54 and it was the leading local flood, flood authority i thought who on earth is that but i know this has nothing to do with the scheme and uh, one further comment about the scheme in general um, the major conversation uh, among people who live in Sturt Road or Camelsdale is sewage from this, this scheme. Um, there's great uncertainty about what's going on. There's scepticism. They think it's a pass the parcel game. Um, and this is something which is going to come back. This is not part of the scheme, but it's bubbling away and people, will, people are looking at this. A number of people speak to me. Some people speak to me at length. And um, beware, I think, is the answer to that. Yeah, well, no, no further comments than I think Russian was the recommendation, which is quite simply that subject to conditions one to 15 and informants one to 10, permission be granted. Those in favour, please raise Thank you, Chairman. Uh, that's 13 in favour, one against, and no abstentions. Then the permission is granted. Thank you very much. Right, we move on to our last item tonight. We'll be glad to hear. It is WA 2021-02666, the land at Great Oaks Farm, Coombe Lane, Chilling Ford, Godalming, GU84XL, the erection of a dwelling following demolition of an existing dwelling and associated works as amplified by ecology report received on the 13th of December 2021, a revision of WA 2020-2127. Carl, who is done to present? Carl. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Uh, so a few update, verbal updates to just run through. So since the publishing of the agenda, there's been uh, 13 additional households have written in expressing their support for the scheme. Um, so sort of not reiter reiterating anything sort of new, sort of just um, citing general support and um, support for the designers of replacing a uh, sort of derelict dwelling. Um, also to update the officer report, the following Chilling Fold neighbourhood plan policy should be included on page 73 of the agenda pack report. That's KP1, H5BE1, B2, TP2, NE1, NE2 and NE4. And then reason for refusal one should include KP1, and reason for refusal to should include any one of the Chilling Fold neighbourhood plan. So this application is for the erection of a replacement dwelling at uh, Great Oaks Farm, Coon Lane, Chilling Fold. The application site is located to the south of Coombe Lane and is situated in the Greenbelt, A and B and AGLV. The settlement boundary of Chilling Fold lies to the east. The existing site comprises of a single story dwelling and the outbuilding. From the aerial view, you can see the site is fairly open and the surrounding areas is verdant in character. The site is bounded on the northern boundary by four, four oak trees, which contribute to the character of the area. In the wider landscape to the north, west, and south, the fields, um, whilst to the east, the settlement of Chillingfold can be seen. <clears throat> Photo A is taken from the southeastern side of the site, looking towards uh, the front elevation of the existing single storey dwelling. You can uh, note the four oak trees in the background on the northern boundary. Photo B is taken from the east and shows the side profile of the dwelling. 
and photo C is taken from Coombe Lane and looking towards the access. So the, uh, the proposed site plan uh, demonstrates the dwelling will be situated, the proposed place of dwelling um, is proposed to be sited approximately within the same location as the existing located slightly off centre in the plot. Um, and as you've previously seen, the existing dwelling is fairly unimposing and single storey in stature. And here uh, yeah, the, the existing sort of single storey floor plans. So it's, for, it's been proposed to replace it with a uh, one and a half storey dwelling. Um, and this is the proposed front and rear elevation with um, gable features and a first floor overhang on the front elevation. And then this is the, uh, the side views of the proposed dwelling and then these are the proposed floor plans which include uh, floor space within the in the roof so the main matters of consideration are firstly the impact on the green belt <clears throat> so paragraph uh, 149d of the MPPF is clear that replacement buildings should not be materially larger than the one it replaces as detailed within the officer report, it's considered that the replacement dwelling is materially larger and therefore inappropriate green belt development, which is by definition harmful to openness and carries substantial weight against the proposal. When, when undertaking a uh, and taking assessment from a spatial perspective, the proposed dwelling is approximately 111% larger in gross external area, which vastly exceeds the RD2A policy guidance of 10%. From a visual perspective, the additional bulk mass height depth and features such as uh, gables and dormer windows and the overhang would make the dwelling visually appear materially larger than the building it replaces. As such, officers are recommending for refusal due to harm to the green belt and being contrary to the MPPF and development plan policies. It is noted that the proposed dwelling would be of an appropriate design that would not be harmful to the AOMB and officers have not raised conflict uh, with this with the relevant policies in the report. However, the, this would still not amount to very special circumstances um, and would not sort of mitigate the harm to the, to the green belt. The, there is a second reason for refusal as well. Um, surveys from ecological surveys from May and July 2019 have been submitted in support of the application. Government guidance states that surveys should be up to date, ideally from the most recent season with the MPPF also stating that the right information is crucial to good decision-making, particularly where formal assessments are required. Documentation submitted, therefore, does not constitute up-to-date information. Notwithstanding, the BAT survey report has identified two roofs within the main dwelling B1 and a roof within the outbuilding B3. Both buildings would be demolished to facilitate the proposed development. Therefore, though the report, uh, the, the ecological reports are now out of date, it has confirmed the presence of active BAT roofs within the development site and that these roofs would be subject to loss or disturbance as a result of the development. As two years have elapsed, it's possible that the status of the bat roofs within the development has changed since the previous survey effort, and bats are highly mobile species. As such, So Wildlife Trust has recommended that further surveys are conducted. These have not been undertaken in support of this application. As such, officers are also recommending refusal based on insufficient ecological information being su submitted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We have a public speaker on this item as well, and that's a Darren Blackwell. We will speak in support of the scheme. Darren? Four minutes. Four minutes, Darren. Can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. yeah. Can you take the slides down, please? OK. Yeah, the, the, the application before you is for the replacement of a, of a particularly small dwelling within the Greenbelt with a modest sized family home for the applicants, Mr. and Mrs. Felton. Mrs. Felton has been associated with the Green Oaks Farm for an excess of 35 years. The current application was registered by the council over six months ago. The application for a replacement dwelling which preceded this application was registered in December 2020 and was then found to be invalid by the planning officer an astonishing eight months later. I'm sure you will agree that the time frame for where we find ourselves is unacceptable and with the original wasted eight months being down to the lack of resources of the planning department at that time. The proposed replacement property is proportionate to the size of the plot 
and is relatively small scale compared to neighbouring properties, especially in height. As the existing property is so small, any increase in scale would invariably lead to a property which, whilst being physically larger, will not be visually intrusive. This has been confirmed by the planning case officer within the report to the committee. Where the floor area analysis is concerned, we disagree that there will be a 41% uplift as a result of the proposed scheme, as we have calculated the gross floor area of the proposed as being just under 100, um, 187 square metres and the existing dwelling with PD approvals as being 170 square metres. Turning to the impact uh, on the openness of the Greenbelt, we believe that very special circumstances have been demonstrated where the realistic fallback position of implementing the approved extension and attic conversion under permitted development is concerned. The quality and design of the proposed dwelling would be a significant improvement from the limitation of the, of the approved extension and conversion scheme under PD. The proposal would provide a visually and aesthetically more attractive building which would enhance the landscape, character and appearance of the area. We are of the opinion that the proposal has not been assessed within the context of the site. The footprint of the proposed replacement dwelling covers common ground with that of the existing property and is positioned within the lowest section of the farm with a backdrop of the mature TPO'd oak trees, which front the highway. Please note that the images of the existing and proposed dwellings on pages 81 and 82 of the agenda document are very misleading. Whilst the proposal is shown at approximately 100, one to 100 in scale, the existing property is shown closer to one to 200 in scale. This results in a lack of clarity and a distorted comparison between existing and proposed. There have been overwhelming support from 14 members of the local community with no letters of objection received by the council. Also, the, Chitting the Chiddingfold Parish Council have no objection to the scheme as proposed. The Parish Council did note that the use of renewable energy should be encouraged. The application as submitted is part of a wider uh, scheme for the farm, which includes the provision for solar energy for the farm as a whole, including the replacement home for Mr and Mrs Felton. Where the ecological report is concerned, there are mitigating circumstances which we feel should be taken into account where its validity is concerned, not least the delays caused by the planning department with this and the previous application. The ecology report was, um, the ecology report submitted identified the potential for back and opportunities within the existing dwelling and an outbuilding on the site. This is not being disputed in any way and if permission is granted, a further survey will be undertaken to ascertain if bats are indeed present or not. Under the circumstances, as the expiration of the report was not caused by the applicants, a condition could be imposed to ensure that the proposal is carried out in accordance with an updated survey. Did to conclude... So to conclude, there is a balance to be made between the attributes of the scheme against any identified harm to the Greenbelt. We believe that the scheme as submitted can only be of benefit to its setting and respectfully ask that support be given to this well-considered and appropriate redevelopment of this section of Green Oaks Farm. Many thank thanks. You. Thank you very much. Right, uh, members, I think Councillor James wishes to speak on the side. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and for allowing me to bring this to committee. Um, as you can see, it has taken a long time and the applicants and the agents, I think, have um, been very concerned about it. Um, therefore, I thought it was fair and honest that I actually decided that if I brought it to committee, it could be decided by councillors and not just under delegated authority, because it is a beautiful spot, beautifully looked after, and at the moment it has, it has a far stables and everything else and lovely horses and they're over all the beautiful rolling hills there. It is in Greenbelt, adjacent to the settlement boundary up there. And it does need to be enhanced. That's the word I always use if it's in the conservation area, it's to enhance. This little shack needs to be enhanced. Whether it's appropriate that it is much, much larger in the Greenbelt policies is what that you will have to determine. In my opinion, that in this open area, with the beautiful oak trees where there are, they are huge houses that you can just see the tops of over the hills and um, next door. 
whether a, a replacement dwelling architecturally far superior to what we've been looking at this evening um, earlier to a lovely oak timbered country small house in the appropriate in that area is what um, fellow councillors I've asked to determine um, it if it was in just the AONB and the AG, it is absolutely appropriate. It's just the green belt policy of the 10% um, increase and it is larger and I would admit it's larger. So I would want it to be open and honest and leave it up to councillors to determine. The parish council at Chiddingfield, who are usually really, really picky, um, have actually no problem because they know the area and this house would enhance what is already there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Hess. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at page 74 in the agenda pack, number 11, the design, the design and impact on visual amenity, AOMB and AGLV. The design of the dwelling would be appropriate for the area and is situated within and the bulk mass, scale and height would also be appropriate and not amount to overdevelopment of the site. The proposed replacement dwelling would be of a design, bulk and mass that would not appear as materially harmful, sorry, materially harmfully more prominent within the wider street scene and AOMB and AGLV landscape. As such, due to the scale of the development, the landscape character would be retained in accordance with RE3 of the local plan 2018 and paragraph 176 of the NPPF 2021. So that's just reading from the agenda pack. It's pretty positive, really, endorsement for it. Um, I would say that to replace the old worn out bungalow, um, a replacement property needs to be larger to be viable. Um, and what I'm seeing on the uh, drawings is a high quality building, um, which would no doubt meet all the insulation and um, current building regs for a high quality dwelling for a family or, or for, an, for a couple um, that work on the farm. So I, I believe it's in proportion in terms of the plot and the setting Importantly, the uh, Chillingfold Parish Council are in favour. There have been no objections. They're going to use green energy, and I think it's a good scheme, and I will personally support it. Thank you, Chair. Chris Lynch. Um, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think we, we do need to make sure you're really clear on there the being a, a, a very, a very Big difference between the visual section of the report which talks about landscape impacts talks about how the building looks um, it talks about what the impacts are in terms of wider views um, the, the green belt isn't green belt policy isn't isn't that um, that, that, that is a different um, that is a different that is a different um, that is a different criteria and actually that wouldn't outweigh green belts harm the um, what it does say in paragraph 147 is that inappropriate development is by definition harmful to um, to the green belt and should not be approved except in very special circumstances and um, yeah the building being well designed the building being fairly small at the moment none of those are very special circumstances and they would have to clearly outweigh um, outweigh the harm this is a situation that we often um, we often have in terms of green belts house extensions um, and um, yeah, this is yeah, over 100% of an increase um, where the guideline is 10%. 10 so it really, oh. it really does. Sorry. It, it, it's, um, yeah, it, it does run contrary to the, to the, poli to the policy. Thank you, Chairman. Coburn. Right. Um, if we are going to be a credible authority, we have to do, make our decisions on the facts and on our policy. Planning is supposed to be plan-led, it says so in the MPPF, and I will bore you with my thoughts on it, but 
you know, we do need to be consistent in our decision making. And if we're not consistent, then we are not fair to anybody, whether it's an applicant or um, uh, a developer. We have, or oh, anybody for that matter, we have to be consistent, we have to be fair. We have had lots, well, I'll say lots, we have certainly had other applications similar to this, and we have turned it down on harm to the green belt, and we have been supported at appeal. We have very, as you know, we have a difficult uh, landscape to defend here, and we don't have many tools, but we do have the special policies for AONB and green belt. We are allowed to give them special protection when other areas, other designations are gradually being weakened. I have no objection to a replacement building on this site of a different scale, no problem whatsoever. I'm not even going to comment on the design because I think the principle here is so strong. Either we protect our green belt, we have powers to do so, and I think we have to do mm -hmm. it. This is just too large. I apologize for all the delays, that, that's inexcusable, but it doesn't change the basic fact that we are not supposed to put anything in the green belt which is substantially more harmful than that which exists at the moment. And I'm afraid this is just too large and therefore inappropriate. And quite frankly, that is what our policy says. We can't say except when or but if. There's no but if, that is our policy. And I'm sorry, uh, you know, an replacement dwelling, no problem at all, but not on that scale and not in the green belt. Thank you very much. Councillor Molina. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the one, I mean, I agree that it always seems strange when the A and B circumstances and the green belt circumstances seem seem to clash. Um, but Councillor Coburn is uh, just being factual when she makes her remarks. One thing I did, in, I did listen to the supporter. Um, Perhaps Mr. French can help. If there's a PD, which is obviously larger than the basic building, is the area of that something which is then used instead of the area of the original building? Can you clarify that, please? Yeah, I can come back on that. Um, so in the case of this property, there is a extension. I can't remember the date exactly. It's provided, but it would be in the agenda um, for a um, for a single story extension. So. When you're making the first greenbelt test, you've got to look at is the dwelling as it is, is it materially larger than the building it replaces? So you don't take into account the, the PD fallback extensions. So then you move on to very special circumstances. So the test is, do the very special circumstances outweigh the harm to the greenbelt? So Sorry, you've gone too fast there. Sorry, yeah. So do you take any account mm -hmm. of the area of the PD um yes. replacement so you do as part of very special very special circumstances which is assessed towards the end of the report so you go for in the first instance and as in the mppf it's it should inappropriate development should not be granted unless in very special circumstances it is then we can take into account other material factors such as the pd fallback extensions and in in this case the replacement dwelling is still about 40% larger, even including the PD fallback extensions. Right. Um, and there, the reason why I raised this, it's, thank you for, for clarifying that, that's most helpful, is that um, different numbers were being quoted by the supporter. And um, I noticed with interest that his increased number for the PD was 10% less than the reduced number for the building. Um, are you satisfied that the numbers you're using are the accurate ones? Yeah, yes, I am. But then it, it, it's not solely a numbers game. It is, while, um, while floor area is useful, it is also down to sort of visual perception. And I would say in very special circumstances, the test shifts from, is it materially larger to, um, does, does it clearly outweigh the harm? And visually and spatially, I'm sort of satisfied that it, is, it doesn't outweigh the harm even with the fullback position. Thank you for, for, for clarifying that. I would also just say to supporters, um, waving your arms about doesn't actually achieve much. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Murleys. I have to say that I agree with Councillor Coburn on this. Green Belt is very sensitive. It's, it's very something we need to protect. 
I see nothing wrong with something being built on there, but I don't want something as big as that. I think we have to stick to the rules, particularly in this case. I'm sorry if that's disappointing, but that's, that's something that I really think we have to, to protect. Councillor Neil, then followed by Councillor Deer. Councillor Neil. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit confused looking at the site plan. I can see it, it is a bigger footprint than before, but it doesn't look as if um, it's going to be a much bigger footprint in, in the scale of the, the site as a whole to me. Um, and I wonder myself how that is going to have a that increase is going to have much impact on the, the green belt issues. Um, generally speaking, I think it's uh, the sort of building you'd expect to come up to replace what's there at the moment, which is a pretty minimal in size. This is a little bit more adequate to, um, for the occupants. Um, so I would want to support it if there aren't any good reasons against it. Thank you. Uh, Chris and Joe, Carl. Um, yeah, just to come back on that. Um, it's sort of the overall bulk and mass, not just the footprint. So um, it's not, yes, yeah, not just the, the ground floor footprint, which as you noted, it is bigger and the test is, is it materially larger? So it's also, you'd have to look above, above the footprint. So we've got um, a single story dwelling turning into sort of a one and a half. You've got gable features, you've got a, dorm, a few dormer windows. So it's all adding to the bulk and mass, which um, attributes sort of to, the, to the reducing openness of the green belt. Thank you. Councillor Deer. Tell it again, haven't you, Mr. Chairman? Councillor Deer. <laughs> Take it first, um, please. Yeah. Uh, mm, and I'm reasonably familiar with the bits of the MPPF that apply to this. Um, and I guess we have to take out you know, our officers' uh, interpretation of the figures rather than uh, anybody else's. So um, it's, it, on, those, on that basis, it's difficult to see um how we do this but it does seem to me that um the the the, the officers are almost fans of this building reading the sort of glowing tributes about how it doesn't uh, affect it if it was an aomb or agov they'd be cheering it on i think and i on balance as these things always are in planning there are a balance aren't they and on balance i think that the construction of this building would enhance the appearance of the green belt. I think what's there at the moment is profoundly un undesirable, unattractive. And whilst there may be a larger than conventional increase in, in uh, the uh, floor space, uh, that the improvement to the amenity, the appearance and the character of the green belt probably means that I would be supporting this application. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, I think we do need to clarify that actually it's not about appearance. Um, it's, it's about bulk and mass and impact on, on openness. The, um, you could say that about a lot of properties that actually the design would be an in enhancement. That's um, not therefore, in officer's opinion, that's not a very special circumstance. It would have to be very special and outweigh the the harm. So, um, yeah. But, sorry, if I may, Mr. Chairman, because it's the point that he, I mean, the design of the dwelling would be appropriate for the area situated. I mean, the bulk mass, scale, and height would also be appropriate. It's, it's, that's that's the bit I read, um, which is why I said what I did. Thanks, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Chairman. No. I think Councillor Coburn is quite right on this issue. I mean, we have to be consistent. Uh, and green belt planning is one of the few tools we have. And uh, I wrote in my notes here, bulk and massing before others have said it. And as such, I think that this is, I can see why people may think otherwise, but I accept the officer's view on this. You, you know this? Well, we're all we're all trussed up like Christmas turkeys on policies. I know that I, I've been in these planning meetings uh, and heard it and seen it. And I know they're all written down, you know, and we can't be ruled by our hearts. We have to be ruled totally by our heads, except, of course, when it came to my town, Farnham, where Balkan mass on Brightwells didn't seem to count for a jot. 
Uh, Look at that monster. This, uh, no, Kenneth. I know, I know, I know, um, I know that. But I would urge people, if you know Chiddingfold, it's full of beautiful big houses. Beautiful yes. big houses. This is not a great big house. This is a modest attached house. For goodness sake, this is being overstated, overplayed. It's just a nice house built to a good standard. And you're all getting antsy about it. It's a little bungalow, which to replace like for like would be ridiculous. You okay. just wouldn't do it. And yes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's an attractive house uh, designed for modern living. I would think the front is rather enthusiastically overglazed, but that's not the point. I mean, it is, it's much bigger than it should be for that plot. And we've got to be very careful we don't establish a precedent by uh, letting things like this go through in the green belt, because if we do it once, we'll have to keep on doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think we will. All right, in case of Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, well, <clears throat> I do agree with Councillor Coburn. Um, I think, you know, we have to protect our green belt. Um, this is a very large replacement building in bulk and mass. Um, and our officers are advising us that we should um, refuse this application for those very reasons. And I see no, no reason to go against our officers on this one, because if we go to appeal, I'm sure we'll probably lose it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Right, I think we'll move to the recommendation. And please be... Sorry. Yes. Before we do go to recommendation, Chairman, um, unfortunately, Councillor Miralees did miss quite a yeah. substantial chunk of the presentation. So therefore, can I suggest that you... Um, I, I, yes, I think it's a bit unfair. The, the wretched woman couldn't get out and it was, should have been somebody else taking her down there, not me. Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh dear. Well, yeah, okay. I don't even remember. I, I, mean, I have to follow the guidelines and, and you know, you can't vote really. Uh, but anyway, coverage. Uh, voting on the permission being refused. So those in favour of the upholding the uh, refusal, please raise their hands. And against the refusal, I to prove it to the uh, to, to, well, yeah, I, it, well, sorry. Mm, Result, please, uh, Kimberly. Oh, abstentions. No abstentions. No. Thank you. Uh, you result. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I know it's that. I know it. I'm... Thank you, thank you, Chairman. So that's four, uh, eleven in favour, one against, and one abstention. Okay. So I'm afraid the application refused. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of the agenda for tonight. Thank you for your patience and forbearing. We've had some interesting uh, applications tonight. To, uh, to I think this is a bit early. I'd like to stay here for another two or three oh, hours. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no